Mexico has taken over a period of 30 years 34 percent of the automobile manufacturing business in our country. Think of it. Went to Mexico. China now is building a couple of massive plants where they're going to build the cars in Mexico and think, they think, that they're going to sell those cars into the United States with no tax at the border. Let me tell you something to China. If you're listening, President Xi, and you and I are friends, but he understands the way I deal, those big monster car manufacturing plants that you're building in Mexico right now, and you think you're going to get that, you're going to not hire Americans, and you're going to sell the cars to us now, we're going to put a 100 percent tariff on every single car that comes across the line. And you're not going to be able to sell those cars if I get elected. Now, if I don't get elected, it's going to be a bloodbath for the whole. That's going to be the least of it. It's going to be a bloodbath for the country. That'll be the least of it. If I had prisons that were teeming with MS-13 and all sorts of people that they've got to take care of for the next 50 years, right? Young people, they're in jail for years. And if you call them people, I don't know if you call them people. In some cases, they're not people, in my opinion. But I'm not allowed to say that because the radical left says that's a terrible thing to say. Confirmed. Uh Speaking as the representative of the radical left, uh, we all got together and agreed that I could I could speak for us on this. Uh, yes, I think that's a terrible thing to say. Yeah, I mean, we're not even flirting with some late fascism anymore. We're just deciding to put a big fucking foot into that sewer. Yeah, it, it, honestly, it's it's amazing. So I, I had an article about this uh, that came out in Jacobin a few hours ago. Uh, the, the speech was on Saturday. Um that's uh the article uh is called yes trump really is dangerously dehumanizing migrants and the basic point that i was making is that 97 percent of the discourse about the speech that trump gave in ohio on saturday was about the first part uh where he used the word bloodbath and uh basically a lot of the early headlines um played up you know, his use of that word in a way that suggested that he was predicting like blood in the streets if he, uh, if he didn't win. And then there were all these, you know, the sort of second way it was all these conservatives pointing out, no, 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 no. But you actually watch it in context. He's talking about the auto industry. He's saying there'll be a bloodbath for the auto industry. Um, and you know, whatever, it's mostly true. Although all so if you watch what we just watched, uh, he does do this weird discursive little aside. That'll be the least of it. There'll be a bloodbath for everybody. Uh, it's like, well, I don't know what that means. Uh, that doesn't sound good. But, uh, but you know, what, whatever he may have intended with, with that part, the, uh, the, you know, use of the word bloodbath, which is what everybody's been hyper-focused on. And, you know, this has become like a whole thing. If you follow right wing Twitter, it's like it's it's an event now. Right. The bloodbath hoax that, you know, Trump was misrepresented about what he said about bloodbath. Even it's Elon like, got in on it. Well, I shouldn't oh, even say even a lot anymore. Elon just fucking like eats that shit up like catnip now. So Elon yeah, got Elon, in on it also. Yeah. Elon is like uh, is like a t has become like an early adopter of like every new right wing thing on Twitter. Um, but, yeah, this is like they're. And it's like, look, I don't even care about that. What I care about is the second part of what we just watched, where he said that some immigrants are not people. Um, you're not supposed to say that. People get very upset. The radical left, they get upset if you say that you know some immigrants are not people. Um, and honestly, the the point I was making in the the Jackman article is that this is this is really really troubling stuff cuz if if you think about the larger context here uh Joe Biden contrary to what you'd think if you get your understanding of the world from from like reading Elon and Cat Turd 2 and you know everybody else and you know all of the um all of these guys on Twitter uh is Joe Biden actually during his first two years in office, um, which I think is what there's, there's like data about at this point, um, deported more people than, than Trump did during, during his first two years in office. Um, 
that, and that's not just in absolute terms, although it's certainly that, right? But that the number of encounters, which is what the Department of Homeland Security calls arrests of uh, of immigrants, that the number of total number of encounters was much higher under Biden than you know first two years of Biden that had been under Trump. A lot of reasons for that, uh, but also that a higher percentage of them were deported and not not released, right? So so that's the sort of ground reality of the situation that there's been this sort of general trend line over multiple presidents towards, you know, towards more um, strict immigration enforcement. And that's actually continued under Biden. Uh, And, you know, what a lot of right wingers will point out is, oh, but um, a lot of people are allowed to stay for years while their asylum cases are processed. uh, And that's true. Although even there, Biden championed a bipartisan immigration bill that would have really shredded the due the due process rights of asylum seekers to to try to to try to cut down on that backlog, and the only reason it wasn't passed is because uh, Trump uh, came out against it um, because it wasn't you know it didn't go far enough it wasn't harsh enough and also a little bit probably because he wants to to keep it as an issue until the election happens. Um, and, you know, so that's the, the background, right? It's, it's, it's already the case that, you know, we've got a backdrop. I mean, it, it's a little bit complicated because those figures are for the first two years and some of the COVID era restrictions did lap since then. But, um, but basically, we've got a backdrop of an unprecedented level of enforcement. Trump is whipping everybody up to say, say that there's an invasion, that Joe Biden opened up the borders, that, you know, that, the, that, uh, um, that you know, MS-13 is going to come pouring across and, you know, kill us all. Um, in Texas, the governor there, Greg, Greg Abbott, said back in January that uh, they've done everything short of, these were the words he used, uh, shooting people. Uh, as they're crossing the border, because of course, you know, the Biden, you know, administration would prosecute us for murder if we did that, which, you know, I would certainly hope so. so. <laughs> but, uh, that, you know, if you, if you kill people intentionally and they're not trying to kill you, right. Um, that you would, uh, that you would in fact get prosecuted for murder. But, uh, but that's the, the backdrop, right? So given this, look, I don't know what, what Trump would do on this if he gets a second term. I don't think anybody knows that. There's lots of stuff he promised in 2016, both good and bad, that he didn't do. Uh, but I you know, kind of end the article with a little um, tribute to to our friends at the Know Your Enemy podcast and, uh, and, and say like the real question you have to ask here is uh, what's Trump giving himself permission to do? Right when he says uh, he says that uh, that that some immigrants aren't people because I have to say where my mind goes when I hear that uh, that you know some members of a you know disfavored group aren't people that they're animals which Trump says later in the same speech he says you know I don't think they're people they're animals um, you know this is what people like Yoav Gallant you know Israel's defense minister. Uh, said on October 9th, uh, the uh, the same the same statement where he announced the complete siege of Gaza, you know, and and since then in that case you've you've had millions of people displaced from their homes, uh, mass starvation, um, you know, indiscriminate bombing, killing tens of thousands of people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I mean, under um, you know, I I think that you can I think there's like I think without um, you know, without exaggerating, without hysteria, I, I, I think that this is like just, you know, that this is if you're, you know, if you're saying, and I know what the defense is going to, you know, is going to be like most of them haven't really bothered, right? But I know that the, uh, you know, most of them have just focused on the bloodbath things, so they don't have to defend this. But like, I know that the defense is, oh no, see, he wasn't talking about all of the immigrants being not people. He was, he was talking about these mythical truck truckloads of MS 13 members being emptied out of the prison and driven to the border, uh, being not people. But, you know, I, I think when you start saying that some members of a group are not human beings, and especially if it comes with a pretty clear implication that there's no easy way to tell which the real humans are and, 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 and which the, the not quite human ones are, 
I, I think it's, uh, I, I think you've at the very least got to ask, it's like, yeah, what's the, what's the permission structure that's being created here to do what? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I want to point out his rhetoric on this has gotten worse, right? When he first came down that, uh, piss collared escalator, you know, to announce his run in 2015, this whole thing was, you know, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best people. Uh, but I suppose once upon a time, they at least were people, right? Uh, now they're not even granted that dignity. Uh, and when you couple that with his very blatant uh, authoritarian gestures going all the way back, you know, to the beginning of his campaign, but certainly escalating since 2020, uh, we have a lot of cause uh, for enormous alarm, right? Uh, I mean, I don't know how many more fucking authoritarian red flags you need to be raised uh, before you start thinking that this is a very, very, very bad path to trod down. Although, of course, there are many people on the American right who are very enthusiastic about going down exactly that path for exactly the reasons that we're so concerned with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, this, I mean, <laughs> look, uh, this is, you know, I, I would also say that there are certain kinds of fears about Trump to which like a fair response is yeah. Okay. But he was already president for four years. He didn't do any of that. Right. And that's like a reasonable response. Say, okay, well, you know, he probably won't do such and such because he didn't make any effort to do it when he was president the first time. Uh, you know, God knows I don't particularly look forward <laughs> to, uh, to, to the second act of uh, that play and seeing, you know, and seeing what the wounded animal version of, uh, of, of the Trump presidency might be like. Uh, but but I think that is fair on certain things, right? That uh, that you you know probably the best guide, as imperfect as it might be, is the first term. But also, when he was president, he um, you know he he did uh, he did the family separation policy, which involved literally tearing children and babies out of their mothers' arms. Uh, and, you know, and in some cases, like never, you know, were never returned, you know, people ended up going up for adoption, you know? So, um, I, I, I think that this is an area where it's like, whatever else you think that Trump will or won't do, right. It's like, I, I see no reason not to take him seriously on this. Oh yeah. And let's be clear. Right. Um, over a million Americans died during the COVID pandemic on his watch. Right. Uh, now thousands of people would have perished either way, right? Because unfortunately, sure. uh, it was an enormous pandemic. A lot of that was beyond his control. Uh, it would be very foolhardy to blame him for everything. Uh, but there is not a shadow of doubt uh, that the level of irresponsibility he showed towards that exacerbated uh, the conditions of COVID enormously, right? Uh, and it really tells you something about Trump and his mindset, right? Uh, there's this kind of idea that conservatism uh, essentially boils down to the idea that there are certain groups of people that the law is meant to liberate but not bind right whereas other people it's intended uh to bind without liberating right uh now i don't know if that's exactly the essence of conservatism at least on my reading but it's a pretty good one for understanding trump because very clearly right uh he thinks that if people want to do uh whatever they want to do as long as they're his supporters then they should feel free to do that right uh but if you're one of these uh, non-human animals so-called uh, trying to cross the border. Well, then he has nothing but contempt for you and you aren't entitled to even that very basic freedom, uh, like being able to claim asylum uh, if you're fleeing from a very dangerous situation, right? Uh, that tells you a lot about not just the enormous lack of empathy uh, at the center of his worldview, but the kind of cloistered banality uh, that's so characteristic of all of that. Uh, and unfortunately, despite its grandiose superficiality, uh, as paradoxical as it is, uh, Millions seem to find it very, very appealing, and I'm deeply concerned that he might get reelected this year. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I think he might. I think there's a very good chance um, that, um, you know, that that because the best shot for him not getting reelected is if Joe Biden does a really good job of inspiring people to vote for him, which, uh, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, this is what fucking pisses me off so much about this. I was dwelling upon this the other day. Uh, and shout out to Nathan Robinson because he's been, uh, you yeah. know, singing this song for a long time. 
Uh, but one of the things that we were continuously told by centrist Democrats and really centrists around the world uh, was, listen, you know, we need to get behind Biden. We need to get behind, you know, the neoliberals. If we don't do that, then Trump is going to win a second term. Or if we don't do this, you know, the Trumpist movement won't be permanently defeated. Uh, now, credit where it is due, you know, Biden did beat Trump in 2020. Uh, and they have won some important tactical victories uh, in 2022. So I'm not discounting any of that. Uh, but the Trump movement is still very much intact and kicking uh, and hungry for blood, quite frankly. Uh, and that is profoundly disappointing uh, when you think about all the horrible things that he's done, uh, which should inoculate any reasonable person against wanting to vote him for him to be president again forever. Right. Uh, and yet because the Biden administration is so profoundly uninspiring, people are looking at it and being like, well, you know, 2020 was bad, but, you know. Maybe give that another shot. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, also, let's be honest. I mean, we've got to connect those two subjects that you just referenced because, yeah, Biden won, but uh, he wouldn't have if COVID hadn't happened. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Like, there's no way that Biden would have won in that world, right? Like, that, that COVID didn't happen in March 2020. Biden barely won as it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Like, he certainly wouldn't have won. I mean, especially in the timeline where COVID didn't happen and George Floyd also didn't happen, where like neither of those things happened. No way in hell by, you know, Biden would have won. Like the, uh, this is, you know, I mean, the basically under conditions of the country being ravaged by a plague and a lot of it being on fire under those conditions, Trump barely lost reelection. Yeah. Right. Like if, uh, under better conditions. Yeah. No, I totally think Trump would have been been reelected. I mean, this is the basic, you know, this is the basic miscalculation, you know, by the liberal base in 2020 that, you know, that because because Biden certainly didn't win the Democratic primaries because uh, people agreed with him more. In fact, uh, Matt and I wrote an article back in 2020 called Land of Social Democracy Still, where we linked some of these numbers and um and in every state that Biden won while the primary was still contested, with one exception, which is South Carolina, because South Carolina has an unusually conservative Democratic electorate. But other than that, every state that Biden won uh, while the, you know, the nomination was still in doubt, uh, they asked in the exit polls, they asked, would you support replacing the private health insurance system with uh, Medicare for all? And yes, was winning all the states that Biden won, right? That, that Biden famously said he would actually veto if it, uh, if it crossed his, his desk. So it's not that people voted for him because they thought that, uh, you know, they agreed with him more on policy. They voted for him because he seemed like a safer bet to, to beat Trump and, and take us back to normal. But, uh, but I, I think that was just a fundamental mistake you know, the, the Democratic voters made that they got uh, at the time, right? That they, um, that in, in fact, uh, no, right? Because um, cause Biden would still be inheriting uh, this, you know, this this state of crisis. And, you know, as there was no, there was absolutely nothing in Biden's record to indicate that he would be, uh, that, you know, that he would do, um, you know, that he would like, be the sort of transformative president you would have needed to actually, you know, to actually like live up to that moment, which isn't even to speak of the fact that for the last five months, he's been uh, so, you know, I mean, he, you know, look, basically Biden had a choice between his own voters and Benjamin Netanyahu and he chose Netanyahu, right? I mean, that that's as, as simple as that, right? I mean, this is um, like to the point where there's a poll where uh, fifty percent of people who voted for Biden in two thousand and twenty think that what's going on in Gaza is genocide, and thirty percent aren't sure. So, uh, and I think that was like New York Times. I, I might be getting that wrong, but it was definitely a mainstream poll. And um, I, you know, got to say, I mean, when only twenty percent of people who voted for you the last time are sure that you know what you're assisting isn't genocide, then you know, yeah, you've put yourself in a really bad situation, and if he loses then, you know, it's it's definitely his fault. Not even to speak of the fact that even in a timeline where the genocide in Gaza hadn't happened, uh, that, you know, uh, that, you know, maybe Netanyahu hadn't, you know, transferred, uh, is you know, Israeli troops to uh, the West Bank to help settlers just before October 7th. 
and you know was was you know was was able to prevent that from happening uh and uh and the subsequent uh ethnic cleansing in gaza didn't happen even in that timeline okay like poll after poll after poll for years people have said over and over and over again they didn't want biden to run again he's obviously too <laughs> old right like uh and it's like ah whatever they'll get over it it's like well man i hope so and you know, I uh, just don't understand it either, right? I'm like, look, Joe, you like ice cream a lot. You like sunglasses. <laughs> just retire to a fucking dairy farm out in the country, and you can have as much ice cream, and you can wear sunglasses all day. You know, you'll have Secret Service people to drive you around. Uh, you know what? If he was willing to do that, I would fucking happily chip into his retirement fund. I'll give him I will, a I would, hundred I would, bucks a month. Yeah, I, would, I would subscribe to his YouTube or whatever he's going to have where he's got there, like, you know, yeah. brain, you know, like, like not knowing where he is completely having a, an ice cream cone and just saying something about like uh, a time cornflake and him, you know, Fuck yeah. the fight. Just bet. Yeah. Biden can sit there and review, you know, is Ben and Jerry's strawberry better than haagen strawberry? You know, you can sit I would, there outside. I would, I would drive out there and personally buy him a cone of ice cream. It wouldn't even have to be a single scoop. It would be like, it could be like the triple scoop, waffle cone, sprinkles. I would shell out for all of it if he did that. Because, <laughs> yeah. uh, man, I do not want Donald Trump to be president again. But uh, sure, it seems like where we're headed. We'll see. But, I want to say uh, just one more yeah. thing about this. Um, this reminds me of something that Zizek said a long time ago about Barack Obama. Right now, Barack Obama was a hugely compromised um, sure. president in many ways. Uh, but he did point out that in terms of captivating people's symbolic imagination, Obamacare did manage uh, to inspire a lot of people to think that a certain kind of fundamental change to the American system was at least possible. Now, we all know Obamacare has enormous defects, right? Uh, but Jujic pointed out, and I think correctly, credit where due, he did shift the conversation precisely by challenging something that was just symbolically taken to be unchallengeable for a long period of time. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I posted something about how Biden really just doesn't have anything that resonates with people in his agenda. No. Uh, and a lot of people got angry at me. They're like, well, what about the CHIPS Act? Or what about, you know, support for labor unionization? Oh, yeah. Now you go you go around the streets, you know, and just, exactly. just, 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 just ask the first person you run into scale of one to 10, how psyched are you about the chips act? And exactly. you'll, you'll totally find all 10 of them. will say, exactly. 10. well, maybe one of them will say 11, right. You know, cause like, that's how excited people are about this thing that, that like ordinary Americans definitely know exists. Exactly. And I was like, look, these are some of these are commendable policies, right? Like I have no problem with more spending uh, sure. on yeah. scientific infrastructure uh, and research, right. Uh, if anything, you know, I say go for it, right? Uh, sure. But that does not resonate with anybody and it does not inspire anybody. Uh, say whatever you will about Trump in 2016. You knew what he stood for, right? Uh, he stood for the wall. He stood for the Muslim ban. Uh, and he stood for himself. Uh, and all that seems to have now coalesced in his third campaign uh, into just being about himself, right? Uh, Joe Biden, you're kind of like, well, he stands for not being Trump. Uh, and that's a pretty good thing in my book, right? Uh, but it's not inspiring in any way, shape, or form. No, not it's for ice cream. Yeah, he doesn't and, you know, what he has it. So uh, uh, you know, again, all in favor of 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 you know the man should you know should should take some time next few years to enjoy that. Uh, you know, he doesn't. You know, at, at this point, whatever else, it's I think it's elder abuse to like <laughs> yeah. roust that man from bed to like give him his like morning briefings and you know expect him to keep it all straight um that's you know there's no reason we need to do that but um <laughs> yeah if, if the uh 3 a.m uh phone call is is elder abuse you, you might need a new president <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly um okay uh so i i got you know that 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 clip that's been in my head for the last two days about how the um the you know we're not supposed to say that uh, that that some of the migrants are are not human beings. That the radical left would get mad. I uh, got preoccupied with that and never actually said who we all are or what we're doing here. So let's do that. Um, I'm Ben Burgess. This is Give Them an Argument. I am joined as always by our super producer Jake Appet and our very talented graphic designer J Andrew World. Uh, we are also joined today by political science professor, writer, author, you know, man about town. Matthew. And nut butcher, apparently. 
I, I don't know what's up with that. Uh, Matthew, Matthew McManus. Uh, in just a few minutes, we are going to be talking about his Jacobin article. Um, Thomas Sowell is a cynical man. I think we have a graphic of that. Um, and uh, but before we uh, before we get to the soul, um, we uh, we have some uh, we have a little bit of uh, of non soul content uh, that we uh, that we need to get through because of course while um, I guess we anyway uh, so uh, while we're getting that uh, then we uh, we do want to hit a little bit of what's been going on elsewhere on the right because of course. Um, you know, while the, uh, you know, while they're like really like, while Donald Trump is, um, is giving himself permission to do whatever it is he's going to do to, uh, the not quite human hordes of foreigners, uh, you know, obviously we shouldn't generalize. We need to focus, you know, we need to also nod at the completely reasonable wing of the right, you know, represented by people who care about facts and logic and, you know, and, and, and aren't engaged in these kind of emotional nationalist appeals. So uh, Ben Shapiro, for example, what does he got cooking right now? I want to play you this clip because this apparently set a thousand hearts aflutter. And let's be real about this. It's insane that we haven't raised the retirement age in the United States. It's totally crazy. Joe Biden, if that were the case, Joe Biden should not be running for president. Hey, Joe Biden is 81 years old. The retirement age in the United States at which you start to receive Social Security and you are eligible for Medicare, is 65. Joe Biden has technically been eligible for Social Security and Medicare for 16 years, and he wants to continue in office until he is 86, which is 19 years, past when he would be eligible for retirement. No one in the United States should be retiring at 65 years old. Frankly, I think retirement itself is a stupid idea unless you have some sort of health problem. Everybody that I know who is, who is elderly, who has retired, is dead within five years. And if you talk to people who are elderly and they lose their purpose in life by losing their job and they stop working, things go to hell in a handbasket real quick. Yeah. Back to work, Grandpa. <laughs> yeah. No, this is definitely um, – this This really speaks volumes about uh, other Ben's commitment to um, – you know, to like those good conservative values of family and, you know, reverence for previous generations. It's like, why should he get to retire just because he's old? Fuck that. Like somebody needs to clean my floor. Come on. Well, I think back, we're also- back in here. What are you doing? Like you think you can spend time <laughs> with your family just because you're 70? You know, that. no, no, no. I cannot see my reflection on this floor yet. You come back. What's, yeah. what's, te- what's telling, uh, uh, r- real quick, is just he says everyone that I talk to about this topic. So I don't <laughs> think that I don't think that he talked to that guy about you know would he or or she uh, enjoy you know cleaning my floor for five more years until they're eighty five years old. I think he talked to his friends in conservative media, maybe some lawyers, maybe some people in uh, you know doing the uh, really important work of uh, producing conservative films. You know those people that retired where they maybe work like. Uh, maybe some of them work hard, but a lot of them probably do not work very hard compared to the average person, you know, maybe work 20, 20 hours a week, if that, you know, those people that retired uh, became depressed, you know, and I think, you know, it's, it's anecdotally, of course, there exists some people that their work really was their sense of purpose. And I'm sure that, sure. you know, Ben, sure. the people that Ben knows, that's a very high percentage of them. But that is not necessarily, as many have pointed out, a very high percentage of everybody that works. So yeah. it's very this elitist. I, yeah, this is what I said when this came out, right? Like, I'm always struck by the enormous lack of empathy on the part of people who do have creative, fulfilling, uh, intellectual kind of careers uh, for people who actually work in very hard jobs where there's minimal pay, uh, very little respect paid towards you. Uh, you're dealing with you know shitty customers or shitty bosses all days long, and you get no benefits on top of that. Uh, You'd think that, you know, anybody with a microcosm of intelligence could extrapolate that, well, maybe that job isn't as pleasant as the one that I have, uh, or at least as easy as the one I have. Uh, But no, uh, apparently that's an intellectual leap that they're not capable of making, let alone an emotional one. And I just wanted to say what's really remarkable about this uh, is Ben was very shifty uh, in the way that he presented his arguments for this on Twitter, because this produced just an enormous backlash, including from some conservatives, which... 
I was kind of happy to see, though I suspect that that's probably in part strategic and tactical because they know their base and they're probably not happy uh, to see a major conservative telling all the boomers that he's going to cut their social insurance since that's probably going to be the people who will vote for Trump down the line, right? Uh, but he said, look, uh, we could fix social insurance and we could fix the pension plan, but we need to raise taxes uh, like they have in European countries. Uh, and this would inevitably fall upon the middle class and we just can't have that. Uh, and this is a big shift from just minutes earlier uh, where he was talking about how it was absolutely impossible uh, to do anything to fix this. So the system just had to die. Uh, and a lot of us were like, well, Ben, you kind of laid out the solution right there, which is a transition to social democracy. But apparently that is just so beyond the pale for you uh, because it would be such an indecent thing to do. So instead, we should just have geriatrics and walkers dawdling around McDonald's at age 85, uh, handing out burgers to kids because that's what a decent society would do. Yeah. I mean, this is this is really amazing, too, because it's also worth pointing out. This is a little petty, but I think it is pretty revealing that one, he says we haven't raised social security age. We fucking did. Right. The, uh, the age for full benefits for social security is 67. It used to be 60, uh, you know, for, you know, for people, you know, our age, right. Like it, it only kicked in, you know, at a certain point, but I mean, that was, that was that decision to like eventually transition it, you know, was, was made decades ago. Um, so that's one thing. Right. He's portraying it as if it's like never been changed. By the way, also a bad thing. It shouldn't be. Right. 65 is old enough to, you know, like you have earned, you know, you have earned your retirement. You should be able to retire at 65. Um, but uh, but it has been. And you should be able to retire at 65 and spend some time with that fucking family uh, that Ben constantly talks about cherishing so often. Right. Uh, you know, if you're age 65, I imagine that for a lot of people, uh, they'd prefer to be spending that time with their grandchildren and their children and maybe even their great grandchildren uh, like my grandmother rather than cleaning Ben's floors. But I guess that Ben really thinks that his floors need to be cleaned. Uh, and, you know, if he can pay somebody who's 80 uh two dollars an hour to do it then you know why not that's what the market will bear and you know what real quick also i mean for the percentage of people that don't enjoy retirement how much of that is also because of financial concerns you know what i mean because there's retiring and then there's retiring and i've seen the difference of people who could retire and not have to worry about money you know so some of these people i mean i i think they're probably still uh, enjoying it over you know like many of the sure. type of jobs that we're talking about but at the end of the day i mean if we don't you know not living in uh at, at the very least a more socially democratic setup there's a lot of uh i mean it's better you know when, when probably when, when when you're old but it's not like the money concerns stop you know so that's it's it's a whole other concern laid on top of that no yeah also uh if you i mean whether again you know again to reiterate you should be able to retire 65 social security has already been raised to 67 but uh but um also when people like ben say that you know it's totally broken and all this like uh andy and i actually did a thing about this last thursday um we watched uh the sam cedars um you know debate with uh with a right-wing caller about this and uh, and actually, like, really to circle and underline this point, you could change nothing, right? Uh, don't raise the cap, don't do anything. And Social Security in, you know, 40 years, whatever, would still pay out at, like, 80% of what it's currently projected to. It just wouldn't pay out at 100% if you did nothing. Uh, so that's alone, right? The idea, you know, like, the... I, I think that's just a sort of ground reality that's that's completely missed uh, in all of this. Uh, also worth pointing out that a lot of the reason that, um, you know, people say, oh, life expectancy is so much higher now. It's like, well, okay, one, one of the reasons that life expectancy is higher is that a lot of life expectancy figures uh, are the overall averages were thrown off by the fact that so many people died as kids uh, in uh, in the 1930s. Um, and also to the extent that some elderly people are living longer, you know, yay. 
Uh, and also, uh, that's also some of that is because, uh, is because of slightly less precarious conditions for the elderly because of social security and Medicare. Um, so it's a, that's a sign of, of success, you know, of, uh, of the program, but, uh, well, I, I should add to that. Like, I think this is a perfect example of exactly what Marx was talking about. Uh, when he talks about how under capitalist conditions, even if improvements in technology won't necessarily lead to improvements in the quality of life for many people, precisely because there are systematic imperatives that prevent that, right? I mean, you see a very similar discourse going on right now about automation, right? Uh, I saw you got an argument about this today, Ben, right? Yep. Uh, I mean, under ideal conditions, there are a lot of reasons for socialists to celebrate the automation of bad jobs. If totally. social conditions were such that people would be automated out of those jobs and were able to find something better, right? Uh, but they're not, right? Uh, because the way things exist right now, they're going to be thrown out of a job and onto the street, right? Uh, many of us, right, would like to think that improving medical technology would mean that you'd be able to enjoy a final 20 years of life, maybe, uh, spending it with totally. your grandchildren, spending it on the beach, spending it, you know, trying to write that great American novel and probably failing, right? Uh, or, you know, your biography or what it happens to be. Uh, but instead, their idea is, no, if you're going to live an extra 20 years, uh, you should be doing something productive with that. Because otherwise, uh, what value or what meaning does your life have to me, right? Uh, and I can't think of anything that is more obscenely representative of exactly what Marx was talking about uh, than these kinds of dispositions that are being articulated so frequently right now by people like Shapiro and Walsh. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is... Um... You know, I mean, yeah, the argument today uh, with um, so it's with a libertarian academic, um, you know, Chris Freeman. I'm not sure. What I should I say is uh, contributing to your and I can is a collection on G.A. Cohen. Uh, so the libertarian yeah, yeah, yeah. perspective will be represented there. So, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I don't, you know, yeah, I don't hate this person. I'm publishing him. I, 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 I uh, I'm all for, you know, uh, yeah, he's a smart guy. I had a debate with him. He's nice in person. Yeah, we didn't want to. We didn't want to do. We didn't want to do this with just people who agreed with us in the collection. But <laughs> yeah. uh, in any case, uh, yeah, right. So I have uh, nothing against him, uh, but I do think he's wrong. And uh, and what he, you know, and and he's wanted as part of that whole argument against automation. I mean, my my thing is, I don't think he really gets the point that socialists have always made about automation. This goes back to at least Marx. Uh, yeah. That is that people. That yes, under you know, under capitalism, automation means that some people are out of a job and some people are working just as hard as other as ever. But under a better system, um, you know, where workers or communities or both, you know, we're collectively uh, controlling the means of production, then you know, um, workers could respond to labor-saving technology by simply voting themselves fewer hours for uh, for the same income, right? That they uh, so. Uh, which would be, you know, obviously much better. And in the course of going back and forth about this, uh, it seemed like part of his point was to attribute uh, shorter working hours over time to, uh, like, to technological advances uh, that have that have happened under capitalism. And you know, I, I would just point out that it's like, look, uh, Bernie Sanders right now uh, is is promoting. Uh, is is doing this big push? He just had like Sean Fain from the UAW testify uh, to the you know the Senate as part of this push for a bill to shorten the work uh, work week to 32 hours. Uh, and he points out that you know since it was legally capped at uh, 30 uh, at 40 hours right in uh, in the 1930s right as part of the sort of second wave of the New Deal. Um, that since that happened, I mean you know productivity has has skyrocketed i mean the, the the increases in productivity since the 1930s have been you know have been stupendous right like that those big you know like like one hour of industrial labor right is just unfathomably more productive in 2024 than it was in 1937 you know, got the Fair Labor Standards Act uh so i think that's 1937 anyway they have a that um but uh, work week still 40 hours, right? Like, so it, it doesn't really seem like this is going to happen uh, without uh, without political intervention, which makes a lot of sense because how would that be in the interests of the people who own businesses? Like why, you know, why, you know, how does that serve your interest to have people just 
work in fewer hours, but make as much money as they ever did. When obviously, you know, you can have, you can lay some of them off and then maybe new industries will pick them up or whatever. But certainly one thing that won't happen is that, uh, is that they'll just naturally be working fewer hours because there's, there's just no incentive built into the system for anybody who has that power, which is why, I mean, the, you know, employer class has been resisting, uh, efforts to shorten the legal work week since the, uh, since the 19th century. I mean, this is, this is what the, um, you know, one of the longest chapters in capital is about that, the working day. Um, and you know, and I just, I just see no reason that that would, uh, that that would ever stop. And, you know, on Ben Shapiro, this is really grim when you put it together with on last Friday, um, Matthew Whalen and I watched, uh, a event that, uh, Shapiro did, uh, at the university of Wisconsin, you know, where he did his favorite thing, argue with college students and 18 year old uh, college students. Let's be clear, you know, master students and PhD students, that'd be a little dangerous. Can't do that. Maybe, maybe even like some cafeteria workers might be a little dangerous for him. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, the high school students are touring uh, the school. Yeah, no, those would be even better. But yeah, do what you can. Um, yeah, I remember a while ago, Norm Finkelstein offered to re-enroll in college if, you know, that meant that <laughs> yeah. Shapiro would be willing to talk to him. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but in any case, like yeah, but... in the uh, in this, there was a point where uh, somebody asked him about slashing university budgets. And he's like, oh, I basically don't think there should be any state support for education because you know if and he was like when i went to college uh i could get private student loans because you know because that was a good investment for the company because they knew that you know i was gonna get this law degree and i'd be able to make lots of money and pay it back but yeah if it's if it's not a good investment and of course he did the usual stupid conservative thing it's like if people are just majoring in lesbian dance theory uh, that you know that major that so many people do in college right that's such a common i have a degree in that I would assume so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is, I mean, when I meet a new person, I just automatically assume, oh, you went to college. Oh yeah. Lesbian dance theory. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, then it's like, oh, why should their education be subsidized? So when you which is also funny because if you talk to Ben on another day, he'll probably be bitching and moaning about how, you know, lesbian dance is just taking over the pop culture industry and everywhere he turns, there's another lesbian dance bar that's opening up because it's a growth industry and that we need to do something to put a stop to the cultural corrosion that, you know, this signifies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, look, if you put this together with the retirement view in that clip, that is that is something else. Right. I, Cause like the combination is like, okay, so I just want to make sure I'm getting this unless you're somebody who's going to become an upper middle class professional who will make lots of money. Right. Unless you're at least at that level that unless you're at least going to be a lawyer or something, then you should go straight from high school to the workforce and you should stay in the workforce until you fucking die. Nice. That is a world I want to live in. I find it obscene too, because like uh, we should be focusing on making ourselves, you know, following our interests, uh, spending time with our families, uh, going out and seeing art shows, concerts, uh, movies, like, like, you know, uh, take in, you know, make ourselves be better people. And uh, that, that kind of, that kind of thinking is, is uh, detrimental to self-improvement. Yeah, I would frame this in a somewhat different way uh, using one of Ben's favorite terms, you know, freedom, right? Uh, Martin Hagland uh, wrote a fantastic mm -hmm. book, uh, This Life, uh, where he talks about, you know, what the meaning of life would be from a socialist perspective. Uh, so if you're into that thing, and I am, I strongly encourage you to look this up. Uh, but one of the things that he points out is that there's this integral connection between the time that you have available to you and your freedom, right? Uh, in a way mm -hmm. that is very commonsensical, right? I mean, if I have eight hours where I'm laboring for someone else, uh, and then five hours a day where I can do what I wish uh, and express my individuality uh, or form meaningful relations with others, then I am more free uh, if I suddenly get six hours rather than those five, right? Uh, and to be clear, right, uh, I think that if we were to move towards a four-day week, which we should, uh, many people might decide that they want to work more, uh, and that choice should be available to them. Sure. Uh, much like Ben, and much like Ben here, uh, I personally suspect that, you know, if I were granted the opportunity to retire, I probably wouldn't fully do it. Uh, might yeah. teach classes that I don't like. But, you know, generally speaking, I enjoy what I do on a day-in and day-out basis. Um, 
not around the time when exams are due, but you know, generally speaking. Uh, but a lot of people don't like their job uh, and would like to retire if they have that option. Uh, and so really transitioning to a four day week and then giving people the prospect of retiring uh, and giving them more free time and leisure time to spend as they wish, all that is freedom maximizing. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's very clear when you hear Ben talk about this, that that's part of the problem he has with this, right? Uh, that there's this libertine decadent quality uh, that he associates with this idea that people can just be left to their own devices to make decisions about what they want to do with the precious hours of their lives. He thinks that it, their life would have more meaning to him uh, if they were working and working hard. Uh, now, he sometimes cashes that out in terms of, well, it'd be more meaningful for them. But then my response is, well, why not let them make that fucking decision by creating yeah, exactly. the context where they can choose to work if they want or if they want to retire uh, at 65 or they want to work four days rather than five. Uh, or, you know, they want to have a little bit more leisure time available to them, then by all means, uh, they have that option available to them. Yeah, no, that is exactly it, right? I mean, like, look, if... <laughs> There's a difference between not doing anything and not having to do a particular thing so you don't starve. I like that. So, for example, Ben Shapiro, presumably, I mean, I think he's the co-owner of the Daily Wire. It's a successful business. Uh, he's, you know, presumably still making royalties from his shitty books, etc. He, uh, you know, he could decide to retire right now at, you know, whatever, you know, you know, whatever, 34 or whatever he is, right? You know, and He's 41, actually. 41, okay. Yeah. Uh, they have Still a, arguing with 18 uh, year olds, though. Sure. Probably can keep that going until he's 50, 55, you know. Sure, sure. But it's like, look, he could retire right now, right? Like financially, he doesn't have to do any of this stuff, right? That there's this, like, he could disappear, right? Never do another podcast, never write another article. Yeah, just lightsaber fights with his kids. Exactly. Right. Uh, which actually, yeah, was probably the moment that was uh, probably the single thing I've heard Ben Shapiro said that charmed me the most. Right. It's like, OK, you know, that actually does humanize him. Uh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, but like whatever, like he could he could we could never hear from him again. And financially, presumably, I mean, unless he made some really bad investments, he would be fine. Right. Nevertheless, sure, he chooses to do this. And I'm sure it is meaningful to him. And, you know, I. I, uh, I, as, as little as I like, you know, what he says, I get that. Right. I mean, if I have, um, you know, if people, you know, continue to want to, you know, pay me to write articles and, you know, and, and, and I'm still doing the podcast or whatever, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll probably still keep doing this until I physically can't too. Right. I mean, I might slow down a few years earlier than like Noam Chomsky or somebody has, but you know, I, uh, but I, I probably wouldn't slow down to nothing. Right. I mean, I'd, I'd still, you know, write the occasional article, do the occasional podcast. I totally get it. Right. But also one, most jobs under capitalism do not closely resemble being a writer or a podcaster, right? That Ben Shapiro and I are both in the having opinions business, which is very different from say working at a meat packing plant. Or, you know, being, you know, being like a cleaning person or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like uh, working in construction, uh, even like the example we were talking you know, talk about off air earlier, right? You know, being like even something that's like formally middle class, but is like a lot more stressful, like, you know, like, like being like a K-12 special ed teacher or something like that. Very virtuous, but like, you know, yeah. something that like my, I mean, my mom. My mom did that for decades, right? She was a spec ed teacher. Uh, whenever people would press her on the fact that she retired at 60, um, she was like, well, do you know how often you fucking complain to me about having to deal with your own kids? Imagine having 20 people's kids, uh, <laughs> all of whom are yelling at you all the time and having that go on decade after decade and then going home and having to look after your own four kids, you know, the four of us, right? Uh, and usually that was enough to- I cannot imagine- in doing that for decades it's totally beyond me and it's like yeah if you want to just go out and you know like just sit in the fucking sun in your garden and play with your grandchildren like don corleone you know yeah. like uh like good you should absolutely be able to do that if you want to pick what did you say you know i drink more wine than i used to you know <laughs> yeah 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 it's like look, I, look we all got to go that one looked like a pretty pretty good way to me but like uh, yeah. that, 
that's great. If instead, or in combination or a little bit of each or whatever, right. You know, you want to do things that are meaningful to you, right. Then you, you know, then great. Right. Like I want a society where there are lots of opportunities for people to, to do that. You know, I think that they have a, I think that, I think there's a lot about how housing works. There's a lot about how much people are working. There's a lot about how uh, far away from each other people have to live right now that makes all this stuff harder, right? But it's like, yeah, I mean, there, there's no reason whatsoever that somebody who's you know retired from their job or doesn't, right? Fuck it, right? If you don't want to, fine, you know, keep going, right? But it's like, there's no reason that somebody who has retired from their job, you know, can't, you know, can't like, do volunteer work that they can't have, you know, they can't be really involved in their church or synagogue that they can't, uh, you know, like there are all kinds of things that are structured activities that are meaningful to people you can do or whatever. You can even get another job. Right. But like, you know, the point is, should you have to, when you've already worked for decades and decades, when, you know, when you're, you're in those last decades of your life, should you have to, and, you know, should your livelihood depend on your doing that? And I just cannot imagine, especially as a, you know, rich person who makes his living looking at the camera and having opinions about things. Um, and making movies like Lady Ballers, let's not forget. Okay, sorry. I forgot about his artistic contributions to cinema. I take it all back now. Um, yeah. Now, of course... Uh, this might all just be me, um, thinking about justice the wrong way that, you know, we should try to arrange social institutions in order to, you know, give people, you know, the, you know, a sort of certain relatively equal share of, uh, of what's good in life. And maybe that's just the wrong way to think about justice. Maybe this is a, um, Maybe what I'm doing, the mistake I'm making is I'm mistaking regular justice for a utopian notion of cosmic justice. I think we have a clip about this. Uh, traditional justice, I guess we can summarize, at least in the American uh, tradition, as applying the same rules and the same standards to everybody. Cosmic justice is very different. It means equalizing the prospects of everybody. And those two things are not only different in concept, they are wholly incompatible with one another. If you apply the same rules and standards to everybody uh, in baseball, Mark McGuire is going to hit 70 home runs, and there are going to be other people who will spend an entire career without hitting 70 home runs, including people in the Hall of Fame like Luke Appling, who twice won the batting championship. So if you want the one thing or the other, you can go for it. But the one thing you cannot do is pursue the two things simultaneously. Or rather, you cannot successfully do that. The Supreme Court has been pursuing the two things simultaneously for quite a, quite a while, leading to a lot of five to four decisions uh, and inconsistent decisions. The requirements for the two kinds of justice are very different. The requirement for um, treating everyone the same is very simple. It's mass produced. Uh, the requirements for cosmic justice must be handmade and tailored to each individual case. Uh, it's much more complex and it requires a much larger amount of government power. Well, I have a few thoughts about this. I'm going to go to Matt, but my, um, my first thought is that if we had a society where you had to be able to uh, hit a home run in Major League Baseball in order to make a decent living and provide for your family, that would, in fact, strike me as a pretty unjust way to set things up. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, fun clip, by the way. Yeah. This is Thomas Sowell, who is the main event for uh, for tonight. Now that we've done Trump and Shapiro, you know, we've, we've, we've completed the, uh, the warm-up. Uh, and... Uh, this, you know, and, and this is like one of the, so, uh, so yeah, we do have the graphic now for, uh, for Matt's, uh, article, Thomas soul is, uh, a cynical man, uh, which is mostly about, it's not entirely about, but it's mostly about soul's book, 
uh, uh, social justice uh, fallacies. And we're definitely going to get into that. I wanted to start with this one uh, because uh, one, I think it connects with a lot of the rest of what we're talking about. And two, this is one of the things that's always driven me most crazy about soul is this, uh, is, is this conception he has of cosmic justice. And now anybody who's like sort of raising certain very basic questions about the justice of, you know, existing social arrangements have, must have some crazy conception of cosmic justice. So I want to get into that before I do though, uh, uh, just a couple of things I want to hit. Uh, we do have, uh, a couple of, uh, we do have a couple of plugs, uh, before, uh, Jake and Andy leave. So one of them, uh, is, uh, one of them is courtesy of Andy. Do you want to, so do you want to set this one up? Yeah. The, uh, Smith college library is, uh, unionizing and, uh, they are yeah. not being recognized by the college, uh, right now. The college is, uh, refusing to recognize that they're trying to form a union. And they're asking people to sign their uh, petition on their website. Um, uh, I don't recall the website off the top of my head, but you can easily find it. Just yeah, we've know. also we've also got a, a link in the description. Yeah, for, for the episode. yeah, go, go right there down click. below the screen where you're watching right now. You should see. Yeah, that. it'll take you to their website, and uh, right on their website, there's a petition to sign. Um, uh, you know, so so it's basically sending a letter to uh, the the uh, uh, college and telling them, hey. I, you know, I support this uh, union. Why don't you, you know, uh, more or less? It's it's a good thing to do. And let's get them unionized. For sure. Uh, and we've actually, uh, this just kind of happened to work out this way. This one came in late enough. We don't have it in the description yet, but we'll, we'll definitely put it in the description. I also did already uh, post this to the Patreon uh, that uh, there's also a newspaper near where I live, I you know, Long Beach is about a half an hour drive away from me. Uh, so the Long Beach Post uh, is also trying to unionize right now. And um, and so we will also post the, they're also doing a petition to uh, to get the Long Beach Post to recognize the uh, the Long Beach uh, Media Guild. Uh, this is, uh, this is actually, I, I think that we're actually going to have a couple of the workers who are involved in that effort on the show in a couple of weeks to, uh, to, to talk about that. Um, apparently I think like the media guild of the West, I believe is the, is the larger organization that that union's affiliated with. And um, somebody was telling me last night, you know, I, I, I would, you know, St. Patrick's day is out at a bar there. I, uh, I, I, was talking to a couple of the workers there, uh, the, some of the journalists there, and they said apparently this is like the fastest, uh, you know, I mean, it's not a huge newspaper, but, um, you know, but, you know, it's it's not teensy tiny, right? And apparently this is like the fastest they've ever gotten, like 100% uh, buy-in on a union drive uh, that anybody, anybody at the Media Guild was aware of. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, I, I think it's, okay to say this. It's also the, um, also, uh, they, they got, um, also, uh, to, uh, to, to represent them in, uh, in their, uh, their dealings. They, they've also, uh, they've also, you got the services of, uh, attorney at law as well as, uh, as well as political commentator, Matt Brunig. Uh, so, um, so yeah, uh, very happy, about what's going on there, please do support both of those things. One last plug before we go into the uh, the soul talk uh, that um, on Thursday, I'm, well, actually, I'm going to be in Michigan tomorrow night, uh, but on Thursday at Wayne State University in Detroit, uh, I'm going to be giving a talk that's going to be sponsored by Metro Detroit DSA and Wayne State University YDSA. That's at six o'clock on Thursday at uh, Old Main uh, Room 103 uh, called Debunking the Many Bad Arguments Made by Israel's Apologists in the West. So if you are going to be in Detroit or, you know, coming from anywhere, you know, from anywhere near there, uh, please do consider coming to uh, uh, coming to check that out. Um, you know, and I could sweet the deal by also pointing out that, uh, there will be beer afterwards. Uh, so if you've ever wanted to come have a beer with me and tell me how much you think I'm just a douchebag or something, this will be your opportunity. Uh, or you can come say nice things also. That'd be preferable. Yeah, that's fine. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> if you, uh, I mean, look, if you, you know, if you've always wanted to tell me I'm a douchebag, you can do that in the Q and A. Be, uh, be much more interesting than just to have everybody come agree with each other. But um, in any case, and then you know, can have a beer anyway, right? We, you know, you're not going to be turned away. But uh, in any case, so uh, that's coming up. Uh, that's coming up on Thursday. And with that, uh, I will see you guys uh, shortly. Uh, and yeah, let's, uh, let's get into, uh, let's get into Thomas soul, right? So before we get into your article, that clip that we just watched, I think is, uh, you know, as the psychoanalysts say, a very rich text. So, um, so let's, uh, you know, let's get into this. Cause I think this does tell you a lot about Thomas soul's worldview, right? He says that, you know, like when he's, whatever it is that he means exactly by, by cosmic justice uh, that, you know, he illustrates with this, this example about, you know, baseball, which again, I think kind of misses the point in a really strange way because um, you know, because like the rules for winning a baseball game are presumably very unlike the rules for life uh, that you, uh, that maybe, you know, Nobody particularly has a right to win a baseball game, but, you know, some of us would like to think that people have a right to, you know, have as decent a life as society's productive resources, you know, kind of enable everybody to have and to be free to spend their time like they like they as they want, like we were talking about before. Uh, but uh, when he's, you know, putting aside how bad that example is, when he's describing the difference between whatever it is that he thinks this ridiculous utopian kind of cosmic justice is, and you know regular justice the kind of justice that he understands uh he says that um regular justice just means the same rules apply to everybody which one of the things that strikes me as interesting about that is that it's just radically uninformative about what those rules should be Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely so i just wanted to say before this right um there are a lot of things that are interesting about Sol. Uh, one of the more engaging things about him is he really was a precursor uh, and indeed the godfather uh, of this whole kind of facts don't care about your feelings strand of conservatism, highly unsentimental uh, and fixated on this idea that they have logic and reason uh, on their side, right? Uh, however, if you read deeper into his book um, or his books, excuse me, uh, or even listen to the clip that you just played, uh, what you realize is that he is at least more willing to be candid uh, about the fact that what this really comes down to, as he puts it, is a conflict of visions, right? Uh, which are kind of pre-interpretive or pre-factical frameworks uh, that we bring to bear uh, when trying to understand the world and also determine normatively uh, what it is appropriate for us to do within the world, right? Uh, and his fundamental contrast is between what he calls the vision of cosmic justice uh, that's propagated by the left or progressives or liberals. You know, there's a lot of different euphemisms throughout his text, right? Uh, which is more or less, you know, the way he described in that clip, right? Uh, there's the idea that society should try to arrange things uh, so that it brings about just or equitable outcomes uh, for any number of different groups, whoever happens to be the so-called victim of the moment, right? Uh, by contrast, he argues that conservatives have what he calls a tragic vision of life, which is not, in fact, actually a tragic vision of life, as I point out in my article, right? Uh, there's this idea that life is filled with imperfection. Uh, it's very foolhardy to imagine that anything could be done that would actually eliminate uh, or even significantly ameliorate the fundamental injustices of the world. So the best thing that one can really do uh, is content oneself with them, uh, try to do the best you can in very limited circumstances to improve your lot and in very rare circumstances uh, improve your society, right? Uh, and this vision, right, um, that he calls tragic but isn't, uh, as I'll get into, uh, permeates uh, a lot of his work. Uh, and he's sometimes criticized, including by people like me, uh, for chastising people for engaging in disciplines that are well beyond their <laughs> purview, right? Uh, well, at the same time, you know, he does that just magnificently, right? Uh, as I point out, at the same time as he was chastising, you know, intellectuals like Noam Chomsky for speaking outside their their disciplines in social justice fallacies, he weighs in on psychometrics and history and military strategy and politics and economics and public policy and welfare policy, right? Uh, and then ruminates about the nature of tragedy and aesthetics, right? Just weighs in on all these different disciplines. And it is really funny uh, to just 
engage in so many performative contradictions, uh, book after book after book. Uh, but there's a reason for this, right? Which is that what unites all of these different disciplinary adventures on his part uh, is this conviction that he has to articulate and defend his vision of the world uh, against this vision of cosmic justice that is encroaching everywhere. Uh, and if you read Sowell's text, what's really remarkable is there is a kind of continuous ideological framework that he brings to bear uh, where he sees difference everywhere, um, but hierarchical difference, right? Uh, there are superior cultures, there's productive and unproductive people, there's the deserving and the undeserving, right? Uh, and you can see elements of this all throughout his work. Uh, and to a certain extent, he thinks that that's the way the world should be, right? That uh, it's good for people who are deserving or cultures that are superior to enjoy their moment in the sun. Uh, and if you aren't one of the superior people or you aren't one of the superior cultures, you shouldn't be looking for political recourse to try to change that uh, or asking for a handout, right, uh, as part of this program of cause of justice. Uh, instead, you should be content with your lot or you should try to prove uh, that you are, in fact, one of these superior people, uh, which will mean maybe rising to the top of the social hierarchy, but still maintaining uh, the social hierarchy as mm -hmm. it exists, right? Uh, and so this is what really unites a lot of his work together in a way that I'm not sure has been sufficiently understood, even by some of his fans, who tend to see him as just a facts, don't care about your feelings kind of person who just tells it as it is without any kind of affective vision uniting this all. I say, you know, just read his book. And he's very clear about the fact that there is a vision underpinning this. Uh, it's just an ugly vision that nobody should want to get behind. Yeah. I, I mean, like going back to the thing about rules and connecting it to some of what you're saying, right. Then, um, you know, presumably Thomas Sowell being a big fan of capitalism, is happy that people weren't just sort of eternally content with uh, the rules of society under the uh, pre-capitalist Ancien regime, you know, that they, uh, that they, they got rid of those. Right. You know, so it's like, it, it, it is presumably the case that, um, that it's possible for society that for there to be basic things about society that actually should be uh be be changed right so if if it's not that right like if if that's not what sort of makes you know like the i mean i think that his his wording there and some things that he says so the book he talks about this uh the old book is uh the quest for cosmic justice um that um that you know some of his formulations do kind of suggest that right which he presumably doesn't think right but if it's well it's not just that the same rules apply to everybody, everybody, but that the rules that apply to everybody are ways that don't make the wrong kinds of distinctions between right. people, right? So it's it's not you know if you have, you know if uh, if you have a society where you know there's uh, there's no mechanism for upward mobility for serfs to become lords or you know Thomas Sowell you know can't be you know can't be an academic you know because he's black or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Those are bad social rules, right? But uh, as long as as everybody has has a shot at the uh, the the better slots, right? Then then you're sort of done, right? Like as far as like what you can reasonably demand of of an of a social and economic structure, then you've you've got it, right? Which is which is why you know to take us to um you know the book that you're you know that you're focused on here you know social justice fallacies um that you know the so much of that is i think very revealingly structured around this view that the only sort of complaint that people could have about social injustice is oh they must think that not everybody has the right kind of shot right that they yeah. uh, that like at climbing to the top but see i will prove that that we do but this is interesting too because like one would think that where the action is really going to be at here is what counts as the right kind of shot right like what like what should what should what in fact should people have to do right under these consistently applied rules that treat everybody the same way along at least the right dimensions you know what is it that everybody should have to do in order to have a decent life or to have as much of the goods of life as other people get to have, or as much, you know, autonomy over their lives as other people to get to have. And, you know, presumably Thomas Sowell and, and, you know, nearly everybody else would agree that there are lots of ways that the rules could be set up 
such that what people were being asked to do was unreasonable, right? That the, uh, that if you have, you know, I mean, if you actually had to, um, you know, if you could like only, you know, the only way to get a, your own house was to score a home run in a major league baseball game, right? You know, presumably that would be unreasonable, right? Or if we had this sort of society where the only way out of poverty was to, you know, win a place by trial, by combat in the warrior cast that, you know, read every, you ran everything, right? Then, you know, presumably Thomas Sowell, you and me would all be fucked in, uh, in that society. But, you know, and, and presumably, you know, he would think that was... I mean, maybe not me. My brother's got a black belt in Taekwondo and is in the military. <laughs> so I just call him and be like, you're my bodyguard from now on. So... <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you could somehow get him to do it for you. Yeah. Um, or, you know, whatever. You could, he could, you could do the Rocky training montage, you know, Eye of the Tiger, and, you know, and, and, uh, and he'll help you win your place. Uh, so, all right. So that works out then, but yeah, like by and large, that seems really bad, but the sort of basic, uh, justice of demanding that people, you know, come out on top in a certain kind of market competition, like it's not just that he, he sort of thinks that's reasonable and I disagree and we have a substantive disagreement, but I don't know. I often get the sense from soul that like, it's not just that he thinks that, it's that like he cannot wrap his mind around why anybody doesn't think that like it's it's just almost not even a question for him oh yeah without a doubt right uh i mean occasionally uh he shows more broad mindedness uh than he does in other works right uh i mean for instance he was a marxist uh for a long time uh and he wrote a pretty good book on marx actually uh not great i want to be very clear but compared Ugh. to uh american marxism uh or anything <laughs> that jordan peterson comes up with Credit where I do, right? Uh, at least I've gotten the sense that he's read Marx, right? Which is a gigantic leap forward, right? Um, but I think I want to go back to a point you were making uh, about the kind of roots uh, of his view of justice. Mm. So there's no doubt that um, by far uh, the biggest influences on his work uh, were Milton Friedman and F.A. Hayek, right? Uh, although I want to point out that in a lot of ways, Sowell is a less interesting figure than Hayek, right? Uh, because he doesn't want to take all the master's lessons uh, on board. Uh, Hayek, for instance, was extremely critical of the idea that America was a meritocracy. Uh, in fact, he pointed out that arguments for meritocracy were just the mirror image of arguments for social justice, right? Uh, where leftists would say things like, well, society is unfair uh, and the deserving poor don't get what they want. And so we should redistribute wealth towards them. Uh, whereas conservatives would say things like, well, uh, the deserving superior people uh, don't get what they deserve, they're entitled to. So we should restructure society in order to give that to them. Uh, and Hayek said that's a ridiculous idea, right? Uh, the market has nothing to do with what people merit or what they deserve. Uh, you know, people who produce smutty books uh, will probably sell more copies of their smutty books uh, than people who produce literary masterpieces because that's what the market bears. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, you know, freedom is not about meritorious people getting to the top. It's about people making decisions about the kind of things that they want to buy and what they want to sell uh, and getting rich uh, based upon how much utility they produce. Sowell has a much more emotionally driven uh, kind of understanding uh, of what yeah. the market entails since he's committed to this idea that there has to be some reason uh, why the deserving people wind up get more rich than his view, right? Uh, but let's go back to the kind of core contradiction uh, that yeah. I take to be at the basis of his worldview, right? Uh, he draws from Hayek this idea that a designed order of the sort that he thinks leftists want to mm -hmm. impose uh, is inherently bad and freedom inhibiting, right? Uh, but, you know, very much like F.A. Hayek, uh, he's quite comfortable with the idea that social engineers need to establish certain kinds of institutions and certain kinds of practices for the market to be able to emerge, right? Uh, and this leads to the really quite fatal question, uh, which is, well, why is it that those institutions and those policies uh, and those practices that you feel it's necessary for us to establish aren't some kind of socially designed order? <laughs> uh, they're somehow spontaneous. Um, so, you know, the basic idea is, you know, if we throw people into jail for violating private property rights, uh, why is that somehow just an entirely natural thing to do? Uh, but 
taxing people uh, to provide public health care. Uh, that's just a fundamentally unnatural thing to do. Uh, and credit where due, some Hayekians actually take this critique seriously and have tried to respond to it uh, in various different ways. Sowell doesn't really do that, right? He just kind of has a gut feel uh, with what he about what he feels is appropriate uh, and what he doesn't feel is appropriate. Uh, and you can really see this contradiction uh, re-emerging throughout his work quite consistently. Uh, take social justice fallacies, for example, right? Uh, on the one hand, you know, he will chastise uh, judges for ignoring the fundamental rights of people uh, and allowing big government to grow and grow and grow, uh, you know, at an ever more rapid pace. Uh, but then just a few pages later, he'll sit there and talk about how judges are somehow creating rights for criminals out of thin air. Uh, and that's bad because we should be trying to send more people to prison. Uh, and you're kind of like, well, I thought that the concern was big government and, you know, it having overarching sweeping powers uh, to violate individual rights. Now, all of a sudden, we have a very clear instance uh, of government intruding on pe certain people's fundamental rights, in this case, criminals, uh, and you're all for it, right? Um, because, well, they're criminals and they don't deserve that, right? Uh, Hayek would never have made such an amateur mistake, I want to point out. Well, no, that's true. He would have, but it would have been more subtle, right? Uh, and you can also yeah. see this kind of contradiction. And I, and I also think that, I, like, look, I mean, to be I'm obviously not a fan, but I, I, I actually think it's possible that, like, you know, it, it doesn't stretch the boundaries of imagination to me for, like, somebody like Hayek to be like, oh, yeah, Miranda rights are probably good, right? Like, yeah. that, the, uh, that, you know, which is, like, one of the things that I've got to say came out in your Jacobin article that's, I think... You know, we'll talk about his virtues in a minute, right? I, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I want to give a complete view. But, like, one of the things that I find most deeply unimpressive about Sol that you really bring out in your article is that he is so unwilling to break from the team yeah. um, at any time, right? Like, 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 in other words, if you're... He's a company man through and through. Yeah, exactly, right? So, like... You know, he has in certain contexts all this libertarian rhetoric, but um, but he was a diehard defender of everything about the Bush era war on terror from, you know, torture to the invasion of Iraq. And it's like, look, you could still like say all your libertarian shit about economics, but like actually stand up for some principles uh, and, you know, at, at a time when the team wouldn't have liked it. Right. And like, now you would actually have a little bit more credibility as a result, but like, he's not going to do that. Right. And you, you point out, he goes straight from, um, you know, like saying on many times that it's like, you know, he, like he'll in many, many times and in many contexts, his shit on like unformed voters who, you know, just don't understand economics and, you know, and, and, and have end up, you know, supporting all kinds of things that aren't good for them. But then look, when the team has decided that Trump is their guy and that like the new party line is that, oh, it's the liberal elites, you know, who, who are, you know, um, you know, who are being condescending to the salt of the earth deplorables who support Trump, then yeah. I mean, he's, he's just willing to be a loyal company man about it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and sometimes these contradictions get extraordinarily brazen, right? As I point out in the article, he very smugly uh, supported the Iraq war when it began. And I mean really smugly. Uh, in fact, one of uh, the first articles I ever read in a newspaper uh, was by him in the Ottawa Sun, of all things, because uh, he was extremely popular, even on the Canadian right, uh, defending the Iraq war. Uh, and then, you know, by the 2010s, when MAGA is just starting to creep out, uh, he's like, well, you know, obviously nation building is a really bad idea. Uh, and, you know, the people who were supporting it, you know, are ridiculous. And, you know, we've learned from then. And it's like, really, Tom, you know, I remember how eight years ago uh, you were saying exactly the opposite. But I guess the winds of change have blown uh, and you decided that reason and logic uh, dictate that you will blow with them as well. Right. Uh, and, you know, I could go on all day uh, about all the different kinds of performative or real contradictions uh, that exist in his work. Uh, but I think that fundamentally the reason for this is he is just a company man, right? Uh, he is, for the most part, quite committed uh, to following the conservative line wherever it happens to go in a way that Hayek and Milton Friedman, whatever else you say about them, uh, weren't, right? They were more independent thinkers, right? I mean, Hayek, mm -hmm. like I said, uh, was bold enough to say, uh, look, a lot of American conservatives want to defend capitalism on the basis that the meritorious will rise. That's a ridiculous idea, right? Uh, under capitalism, you know, pornographers producing, you know, 
summer porn, you know what I mean? About, you know, people taking their shirts off on the beach will make hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and you'll get, you know, great novelists who will live on pennies uh, until the day they die. Uh, and that's just the way that the market works, right? Uh, or Milton Friedman, right? Milton Friedman was occasionally willing to at least entertain the idea of instituting something uh, like a UBI. Uh, and also, you know, was willing to support um, at least the idea of unionization, where he pointed out, well, forming a union might be a kind of right uh, that people should have, uh, given that it's a form of freedom of assembly, right? Uh, Sowell's just not that kind of person, right? You know, he tends to stick pretty closely uh, to what other people have said, which is why when you read his books, uh, they really quickly become just enormously boring, right? I mean, there were points when I was reading Intellectuals in Society, uh, when I saw dogs out on the street watching the grass, and I really envied them, the intellectual stimulation that that must have entailed, uh, because by the time he just starts repeating the same jokes over and over and over again in the same book, uh, you're just kind of like, oh, God, it's like I'm in some kind of horrible time loop. I'm in Groundhog Day, right? Uh, and then when I had to realize as part of this assignment that I had to go through thousands of pages of his writing, uh, I seriously just contemplated what I was doing with my life that had led me to that moment, right? Uh, so anyway, that's just me complaining, right? No, no, fair, fair enough. I, I said the other day, this is, you know... I mean, it really like, yeah, taking on the thousand pages of soul for, for this article really, um, you know, really kind of feels like you're a literary sin eater, but, uh, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to neglect the man's actual virtues. Uh, so, uh, Jake, if we have the clip, this is from the, uh, unlearning economics YouTube channel. What do I like about soul? Above all, I appreciate his attempts to communicate economics to a broad audience. In basic economics, he makes a point of avoiding mathematics and equations, sticking to plain English. Every voter and every politician that they vote for affects economic policies. We cannot opt out of economic issues and decisions. Our only options are to be informed, uninformed or misinformed when making our choices on issues and candidates. Basic economics is intended to make it easier to be informed. That's part of what this channel is all about. There wasn't that much economics on YouTube and what there was wasn't great in my opinion, so I thought I'd try to contribute. I've always been passionate about public education and economics, so Sol and I are on the same page here. I tend to use graphs and figures a bit more than he does, but I expect we share the idea that these need to be fully explained in plain English and used only when necessary, instead of getting lost in a forest of maths and statistics. Sol does write with clarity, and it's difficult to be unsure of where he stands on a given topic, something you can't say for every writer. I'm partially in agreement with Sol about the utility of markets and the failure of Soviet Union-style central planning. He makes some decent historical observations about the futility of trying to plan the economy 100% from the top down, and the perverse effects this had in the 20th century. I'm basically with him on this conclusion, albeit with some important caveats. I found several other parts of Sol quite interesting. The chapter of basic economics on productivity and pay contained parts which clarified my thinking. The section on the history of thought was pretty fun and I only wish it had been longer. No coincidence that that was his PhD thesis. The section on macroeconomics shows that Sol is wise enough not to be a gold bug. There's a whole section on the law in Knowledge and Decisions which taught me a lot about the history of the American legal system. And so on. Overall, Sol has an approach to economics which is sometimes useful in understanding key debates and which leads him to conclusions which make sense in those cases. He has a mission to communicate these ideas to the public with clarity, which is why he has released so many books and makes so many public appearances. Many people on my side probably dislike Sol, but I can genuinely say that I find it helpful to have somebody synthesize the free market perspective on economics and have it all in one place. Okay, with all that said, this is not a good book, and, and neither is other one. Yeah, no, I, I agree with all that, right? Uh, by the way, I should say I did love that video, and I want to give mad props to Unlearning Economics uh, for producing it. Uh, look, uh, he is without a doubt a very clear writer, right? Uh, and I think, in fact, that many leftists could learn uh, from trying to emulate that level of clarity and exposition, right? Uh, Nathan Robinson made a same, uh, similar point. Uh, in his own critique uh, of Seoul. I also think that there is something to be said for the fact that he does have a real knack for taking difficult concepts and being able to boil them down uh, in a way that is publicly digestible. And there's a real talent behind that, right? Uh, and then I suppose the third thing that I'd say that's nice about him uh, is, again, every now and then, and I really want to stress, every now and then, he is capable of developing 
very solid and thought through critiques of left wing positions and left wing authors. There's if he respects them. Right. Uh, and a good example of that would be his Marx book. Right. Which, again, I think there are a lot of very clear mistakes, uh, interpretive mistakes about what Marx was going on about. Uh, but, you know, it's leagues ahead of a lot of the other stuff that I see. Right. Um, that's about, you know, all the number of good things uh, I could say about him um, in terms of, you know, uh, his various gifts. Right. Uh, but I think, you know, the main problem that I have with him uh, is just this idea that fundamentally what he is articulating uh, is a tragic vision uh, of society, uh, both because I don't think that, you know, his historical um, and political anecdotes bear that out, uh, but also because I think he has a very bad understanding uh, of what tragedy entails, right? Going back to antiquity, uh, one of the things that's very interesting about the literature on tragedy is how it always stresses that tragedy emerges from some kind of striving, uh, you know, whether to better yourself or to better society or whether you're an individual or you're an entire community, right? Uh, and in a tragic work, uh, what you usually see is people, again, trying to better themselves or pursue some kind of goal uh, and failing, right? Whether because there's some kind of external external barrier to their success uh, or because, um, you know, they were ultimately brought down uh, by fatalism uh, or, you know, the various kinds of problems that the world always poses upon them. Uh, or there was some tragic flaw to the people who are trying to improve themselves. Uh, consequently, everything just went to hell, right? Uh, the Godfather is tragic in that sense, mm -hmm. right? You have a protagonist uh, who wants to be better than his family wants to allow, uh, then decides that he's actually going to get involved in the family and try to improve it and make it straight. Uh, and then the kind of world colludes um, along with his own personal defects uh, and ensures that nothing actually gets better, right? Uh, great movie for that reason. Uh, Soul's kind of outlook is, look, uh, you shouldn't really try, right? Uh, you should resign yourself for the most part uh, to accepting you know, as Thucydides uh, once put it, that this is a world where the strong do as they will and the weak do as they must. Uh, and that's not going to change. Right. So uh, maybe what you can do is try to ensure that you will be the strong one day. Uh, and if you're able to do that, then, well, you deserve to be up top. Uh, but this fundamental structure of injustice uh, is immutable. Pretty much. Right. Uh, and that to me is not a tragic vision of trying to struggle uh, against injustice. Uh, I think the left really captures a tragic spirit uh, when a lot of people quote Samuel Beckett. Right. Fail, fail again, fail better. Right. right exactly. uh, what this really is, is, again, this kind of cynical attitude of uh, do the best you can for yourself. Uh, try to make sure that if there's going to be someone on top and someone's going to be on the bottom, that you're the one on top uh, and just recognize that doing more than that. Uh, is very likely to either lead to nothing uh, because the fundamental system can't change or you'll just make things worse uh, because you're dallying with forces that you can't possibly understand. Uh, and when he aligns that or tries to align that uh, with, say, a fundamentally American outlook, uh, I think that that's absolutely ridiculous, right? Uh, let's go back to somebody like Thomas Paine, right? Uh, Thomas Paine, famously, you know, an American revolutionary, right. supported the American Revolution on the basis that we have it in our power to make the world anew. Uh, and of course, every single American revolutionary agreed with him, right? Uh, they didn't just sit there and think, well, yeah, you know, we really don't like living under the Ancien Regime, uh, but, you know, the strong do as they will, the weak do as they must, uh, and we are the weak in these kinds of circumstances. And so the best thing that we can do uh, is try to eke out a reasonable living here. Uh, and we shouldn't be trying to interfere uh, with the fundamental systems that govern the world, right? Uh, and even American conservatives have picked up on this kind of radical revolutionary spirit at point. I mean, Paine, uh, who's a hero of mine, uh, may have said that in the 18th century, but it was Ronald fucking Reagan uh, who pointed that out in the 1980s, right? Uh, when he invoked Paine to say, yeah, well, we have it a power in the work the world new, uh, which also, to my mind, demonstrates that I don't think Sowell has a very good understanding of what the conservative tradition is about, uh, because, yes, there is a kind of tragic, sorry, a cynical, resigned form of conservatism that's very popular. Uh, but just look at you know Trump and Trumpism, right? Uh, the right has never been immune uh, to the temptation to say our society is broken and we need to fix it, uh, because usually they think that we moved too far along the road to something like genuine equality and genuine democracy. Uh, so we don't just need to put the brakes on. Uh, we need to reverse course as quickly as possible. Yeah. Uh, so a few thoughts about that. But first, I saw uh, since the Unlearning Economics video had the line about Soviet form of economic planning. And so most said, uh, 
uh, says Soviet Union central plan is why Russia has the industrial base that it does. And later on mentions the arms race and says something about how China continues to have five year plans. And isn't China doing all these amazing things? I would just say, um, I think if you're going to have a historically realistic view about this, uh, I think that what the Soviet form of planning was really good at, right? So in his, in his book was like, building like tons and tons of tra like tractors and tanks very, very quickly. Right. That, uh, which, uh, and you know, thank God for it or else Hitler might've won the war. Uh, but uh, I don't think he might've won the war, you know? Yeah. Would have won the war. Right. The, uh, um, but, uh, but ultimately, you know, Bhaskar Sankara, you know, I might be, he might've been quoting somebody, but Bhaskar says in the first chapter of his book, uh, the socialist manifesto, uh, which is where I remember it from, right? You know, that that form of planning was all, you know, thumbs and no fingers, uh, meaning that, like, again, very, very good at pumping out tons of tractors and tanks very, very quickly, very bad at coordinating production with fine grain consumer needs, which is part of why you had the kind of mass dissatisfaction that, you know, helped to lead to the end of the system, why most Soviet workers weren't willing to stand up to defend you know, the alleged worker state, you know, when it was coming down. And also, by the way, why China, even if it's retained certain aspects of that planning, has moved away from it so dramatically in other ways, you know, from 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 Deng onward. Right now, I don't, you know, I don't, the conclusion that I draw from that isn't, okay, I guess we'll have to settle for capitalism after all, or even settle for this sort of strange hybrid of whatever you want to call China today, which is, you um, you know, has an unusually large role for, you know, state planning and certain kinds of very high level shepherding of economic uh, priorities, but is also in many ways a very standard capitalist society with like lots of extremely poor people and lots of billionaires, right? That's certainly not the world that I ultimately want to live in. But to me, the lesson is just what you quoted earlier from Beckett, right? That uh, try, fail, try again, fail again, fail better, right? That the, uh, that, um, you know, this is uh, this is Zizek's point in def in, uh, in defense of lost causes. You know that uh, where you know even though even though Slavoj was a democratic dissident in uh, in you know Yugoslavia, you know he says there's a certain point respect in which he you know prefers even Stalinism to like a certain kind of like cynical liberalism. And he's not you know he's not saying that he literally likes Stalinism, right? People love to freak out about that quote, right? That's clearly not his point. Right. His point is that it's like he he he's mourning what's lost in that sort of drive to uh, to remake the world. Right. Like, I think we can mm -hmm. I think we can remake the world in a better way than, you know, Stalin's Russia or even, you know, uh, or, or contemporary China or any of these things. I, I, I think that we can have a better form of socialism. But I think that you can be, you know, but but I think this actually does tie in because this is you know, the unlearning economics point, you know, about how you can sort of give somebody like soul credit for like when he's making negative arguments, that's like, Oh, well, here's a place where he makes a good point without saying, therefore you have to adopt soul's perspective. You can just say, um, yeah, all right, fair enough. He's, there's like a decent argument that he, you know, that he's made. It doesn't mean I have to accept his conclusion. It's that I have to think about how to say a better version of my thing that uh that that gets that gets past this argument because ultimately you do still have your eyes on the prize of like a fundamentally different and better form of society and then you know when it comes to how all this interacts with soul i mean this really does take us back to the cosmic justice stuff because soul is um is you know like when he says like oh somebody you know marks or even rawls uh, you know, mm. they, they think that there's, you know, he wants to society to be arranged in a certain way, but who's doing the arranging, you know, what's all this arranging that sounds authoritarian, uh, this, you know, what he's doing is, you know, he's doing what like Michael Brooks talks about in, in against the web, right? This is the naturalizing, uh, strategy for defending the capitalist status quo, where you sort of portray it as if capitalism is something that sprouts out of the ground. Oh, exactly. In nature. And it doesn't have to be arranged. And it's like, no, that, you know, there's a lot of arranging going on to get you there. Right. Like to, you don't get from like, you know, the social structures of medieval England to contemporary capitalism 
without a whole lot of very deliberate, you know, uh, socially engineered rearranging going on. I mean, this is, you know, like, like most people, you know, like sticking with the Britain example, most people not that many centuries ago lived on land where they had certain kinds of feudal rights as peasants to like, you know, for them and their family to like, you know, to like farm their little plot of land, but they also had to spend some time farming the Lord's land. And, you know, there's this incredibly violent and bloody process of driving them off that land to, to create the possibility for, of capitalism. And that's the old world. I mean, the, you know, the, the rise of capitalism in, in Britain is, is, is like a, is, is like a, you know, is is like a cozy, comfortable story of of consensus and nonviolence compared to what happened on uh, on this continent, right? You know, mm-hmm. where uh, the you know which which involves a lot more you know slavery and genocide, you know. But uh, this is you know, but this is you you can't you know you are you know you're making you're making the world in certain ways, right? I mean, the, the sort of revolution that brought us capitalism was a, was a revolution. You know, you're, you're violently undoing old ways of organizing society and instituting new ways of organizing society and, and quelling resistance to it and all of that. And, and, you know, and, and to maintain it to this day, right? I mean, you have to, um, you know, you have to maintain, a certain set of, of property relations, which involves tremendous amounts of coercion to, to, you know, make sure that people are only using the resources they're supposed to use. They're not using other resources without permission. Uh, you know, that you're, you're evicting squatters, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, you know, this, this is the, the thing that I always found so disappointing about these kinds of defenses of the system that, you know, like somebody like soul doesn't really have the courage to say, yes, I understand that, you know, there's political intervention that has to go on to make the world the way I want it to, but this is just political intervention. I approve of, I think this is the right kind. And here's why instead he he has to portray it as if the choices are like some sort of capitalism that, you know, sprouts out of the ground as a natural process. And then this like bungling political intervention, that's like, everything other than laissez-faire economics. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I want to be very clear, right? Again, this is what makes Hayek a more interesting thinker than Sowell, right? Uh, I mean, if you read Hayek's work on liberalism, one of the things that he's very clear about is that liberalism was never committed to laissez-faire, right? Yeah. Uh, he's very expressed in the Constitution of Liberty that laissez-faire is an anarchist idea, right? Uh, he points out that liberals, as he understands them at least, not liberal socialists, uh, right. are committed to law and order. Uh, they believe that there are certain things that the state normatively should do, right? Uh, now, this makes his idea of spontaneous order, uh, the idea that there are just kinds of orders that emerge uh, from the free choices of individuals without any kind of social theory, uh, very tendentious uh, to my mind. Uh, and not just to my mind, I should either. Some libertarians like Matt Solinsky has pointed this out again, right. uh, because then you say, well, if Law and order is arranging things in such a way uh, so that something like the market can exist. Uh, then why couldn't we arrange things in different ways? Uh, if that would seem to be to the benefit of people's overall welfare, for example. And I don't yeah. think Hayek has a very good answer to that. But at least he's cognizant of the fact that this is a serious problem. Uh, and sometimes uh, it could get very funny, right? Uh, people in the 1970s used to point out to him, like, look, you know, uh, if you're so fond of this idea of spontaneous order uh, and that we should accept the enduring wisdom uh, that is contained within longstanding institutions, uh, then why not something like the welfare state that's been around for 30 years? Uh, How did this not emerge spontaneously? uh, And why should we not respect the embedded wisdom uh, that it contains? And his response, again, was at least a little bit more nuanced, right? He'd say, well, you know, I never said that, you know, we shouldn't do any kind of welfare programs. You know, I supported things like public health. Uh, I'm willing to flirt with the UBI and maybe some kinds of employment insurance. Uh, but anything more than that would be economically inefficient. Seoul is just not prepared to even make these very basic kind of conciliatory gestures towards nuance, uh, precisely because, as you pointed out with your invocation of Brooks, uh, his view is just that this is, to a certain extent, natural the whole way down, uh, because this is the way that the world operates, according to his vision. Uh, And it's really quite deflating uh, once you realize that about him, because he just seems like he has quite a bit less original to say uh, than what one would expect, given the fact uh, that, you know, he's got that guy on Twitter who just tweets out quotes by him a thousand times a day, right? Um, and, you know, 
I could say more about this, but I think I'll just I'll just stop right there before, let you, and let you respond. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, thinking about that defense of capitalism, I think is also going to be relevant when we zoom in a little bit and look at his uh, defenses of more specific uh, aspects of the status quo, right? So in the article, you mention a bunch of his books. You, um, you know, you talk as you have in this conversation a few times about intellectuals and society. Uh, you mention uh, in the article, economics, facts, and fallacies, economic facts and fallacies, uh, you know, race and culture, um, which, uh, by the way, very relevantly, since it was just St. Patrick's Day, can, contains a, a really um, j- jaw-dropping uh, defense of uh, of anti-Irish uh, prejudice. Yeah, anti-Irish prejudice that you know that employers who who hung no Irish need apply signs were actually like just reacting rationally to all of the crime and disease and disorder among Irish immigrants, uh, that um, which is is just you know, kind of amazing, actually, especially even given his own definition of justice as applying the same rules to everybody, uh, which, you know, that obviously right? fails, right? <laughs> well, this is where I argue that his account of the American tradition uh, that he articulated in that Oving statement uh, is both is wrong on both horns, right? Uh, the American Revolution was both more conservative than he's willing to give it credit for and more revolutionary than he is willing to give it credit for. It was more revolutionary in the sense, again, that very clearly – uh, the American founding fathers were profoundly committed uh, to the idea that they were going to create a new kind of society, right? Uh, in fact, they were self-congratulatory precisely about their willingness to innovate in that respect, right? Uh, and there's a reason why Paynean rhetoric about starting the world anew uh, had such a glittering resonance at the time. Uh, so if we want to restart that proud American tradition uh, of overthrowing uh, aristocratic forms of domination uh, and replacing it with more democratic forms, then by all means, I'm all for it, right? Uh, But the American Revolution was also far more conservative in some Mm -hmm. respects uh, than he's willing to give it credit for, uh, precisely because they, American founding fathers were certainly not committed to the idea that everyone was going to be moved to the same equal starting line uh, and then would just compete from there, right? Uh, Slaves, indigenous people, children, the non-propertied, uh, and of course women, you know, uh, they all thought it was appropriate to deny them even formal legal equality. And it's not like there weren't people who were advocating for those kinds of equality at the time. Uh, Abigail Adams actually wrote a very <laughs> nice letter uh, to her husband, John Adams, saying, hey, you know how you're invoking all this Lockean rhetoric uh, about how people's natural rights to freedom uh, are being denied uh, with the establishment or the retention of the monarchy. Uh, couldn't women say something very similar about the existence of these patriarchal social structures that seem to be denying our natural rights? Uh, and Adam's response was, uh, yeah, you know, that's an interesting point, but it's too bad, basically, right? Uh, yeah. And, you know, I don't need to rehash kind of the kind don't, of argument. Don't, uh, don't worry your pretty little head about it. Yeah. Uh... Exactly. And, you know, these groups need to fight very hard uh, in order to achieve certain kinds of equality. Now, again, what makes Tom so interesting as a black conservative is very, very rarely uh, he will be willing to give liberals a very small amount of credit, right, uh, for pushing through these political demands for equality. Uh, because how could he not, right? Uh, but it's very minuscule, right? Uh, and what's far more representative of his work is the defense of prejudice, right? And the sense that you were just describing uh, the idea that if we use racialized forms of distinction, uh, in order to make shorthand judgments about people, particularly if we're employers. Uh, yeah, that might be unpleasant and that might even be wrong, uh, but employers are entitled to do that against the Irish, for example, uh, because there were a lot of drunk Irish at the time uh, from his perspective, right? Uh, and yeah, every Irishman who applies for a job in the 1840s or 50s uh, might not be an alcoholic, uh, but it was safer for employers to just assume that they were, right? Uh, and busybodies who want to challenge those prejudices by using cultural or social or state pressure uh, to try to deviate from it, uh, they're being wrongheaded and denying people's liberty to be discriminatory in this way if they so like, right? But again, he's never really very consistent on this point. Yeah. I I mean, look, this is the, I mean, just the causation he's assuming is also kind of amazing um, that, you know, he takes it for granted that um, every sort of, you know, 
every part of uh, like stereotypes about Irish people in this era that this was all like accurate and that uh, the reason um, <laughs> that, yeah, the fact that there were so many people who were talking about, you know, encouraging the Irish to behave better, you know, proves that it must be right. Uh, and that, um, and that the fat and that they were um, that like, you know, his portrayal is like, Oh, well, the reason that the discrimination stopped is that the, the Irish got their act together and, you know, they, they, they stopped being, you know, violent, alcoholic, you know, layabouts. Right. And it's like, okay, maybe, or maybe make that, Ireland great again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe it's that every time there is a impoverished underclass, with some kind of racial or national or, you know, linguistic, you know, religious markers, people always come up with some sort of just so story to justify why those people are poor. Oh, it's because they're lazy. It's because they're all, they all drink, you know? And then once the economic conditions change and, you know, and, and that's no longer, those are, are no longer like recent immigrants were mostly poor uh, that, you know, that they've, that, uh, you know, the economic uh, uh, conditions change, people have less need of like a reassuring story about why it's okay that they're living in those conditions. And, you know, the stories become less popular, right? I mean, like this, at, at the very least, that seems like a pretty intuitively reasonable alternative explanation. And I just don't see a lot of evidence that soul has like considered it or has some sort of argument against it. No, absolutely not. And it's really important to emphasize whose freedom uh, he thinks is important right here. And this is what really makes him a conservative rather than a libertarian, right? Uh, Sowell is very keen to defend the right of employers to engage in shorthand prejudicial decisions uh, in order to make the most economically optimistic decisions they can about who they want to hire. Uh, and if that means that less Irish people would be hired than otherwise because the employer has prejudicial views about the Irish, then so be it. They're entitled to that kind of freedom, right? Uh, but individuals gathering together to exercise their democratic freedom uh, to try to challenge those prejudices, right, whether at the cultural or the state level, uh, that is something that he is not fundamentally comfortable with, except, again, in very rare uh, interests, right? Uh, and I can tell you straight up, right? Uh, I think that if you were to ask people whose freedom is more important, right? Uh, the freedom of employers to discriminate against the Irish, whether or not uh, these people even have these bad attributes, uh, because that is useful for them, uh, they think, at least uh, in deciding who's going to get a job and who's not. Uh, or is it more free for people or more important for people to have the freedom to fundamentally resist the forms of domination that impose upon themselves, uh, sorry, that impose themselves upon them? Uh, I think that almost any sensible person would say the second are vastly more important to us. But Soul, again, as a company man, uh, is always somebody who's going to be far more sympathetic uh, to the damage that's been caused to the liberties of the rich in society and the powerful in society than the exercise of freedom on the part of the masses, uh, especially, you know, in moments, as you pointed out, where he'll just sit there and be like, look, a lot of these people uh, are pretty vulgar uh, and uneducated and don't really know the way that the world works. So they probably shouldn't be voting anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Unless, of course, we're talking about... Unless they want to vote for Trump. Yeah, in which case damn those liberal elites, you know, trying to, uh, to, you know, portray them as being uninformed. Um, yeah. So, so I want to, in our last few minutes, uh, I, I do just want to get into, um, a little bit more specifically on the, uh, the main book, uh, that you're focused on in your, uh, in your Jackman article, which is called uh, social justice fallacies. Cause I think, I think the first couple chapters of this book in particular, like get at a lot of important things about soul's worldview and maybe show you something about his, his appeal, but I think also something about how unserious a lot of his, his analysis of like the underlying social realities are right. Like, so uh, chapter one, is uh, called uh, equal chances fallacies, and then um, chapter two is racial fallacies, which uh, which is you know a lot of that continues the uh, the same themes, but 
the equal chances fallacy is particularly so just 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 to set this up right like what is what does soul mean by that right what's the what's the you know equal chances fallacy that he thinks that people are engaging in well there are a few right uh, i mean fundamentally soul's outlook is foundationally anti-egalitarian right uh, again if you read through his work uh, he's very committed to the idea that there are superior cultures there's more productive people uh, and that's as it should be right uh, we should rank in order uh, individuals communities cultures in this kind of way uh, and if we try to disrupt uh, the kinds of natural hierarchies that he projects onto nature and onto social reality uh, by trying to give people equal opportunities uh, or equalize outcomes in any kind of way, uh, then again, we're engaged in this quest for cosmic justice to try and uh, trying to engineer society uh, to produce outcomes that nature wouldn't allow if things were just allowed to run their course, right? Now, I want to be clear. Uh, there is a certain germ of wisdom here, right, mm -hmm. uh, that you gestured to when you pointed about the problems with collective planning, right? Uh, Unlearning Economics talks about this with great eloquence and great power in his three-hour critique of soul, right? Uh, it is the case, right, that not every plan uh, that is guided by benevolent motivations mm -hmm. uh, to try to redistribute wealth or redistribute power uh, is ultimately going to be successful. In some sure. states, it might very well be calamitous. Uh, and we should therefore be cautious uh, about implementing social plans, especially very ambitious social plans, and try to ascertain through experience and through looking at data uh, which ones happen to work more effectively than others, right? Uh, sure. Although even there, right, uh, Albert Hirschman in his great book, The Rhetoric of Reaction, points out that Sowell smuggles in uh, certain kinds of emotionally driven affects um, when it comes to evaluating social planning. Uh, because so we'll, we'll almost always say, well, if we plan for things that we don't know that we won't produce uh, negative consequences. Uh, so we should be cautious uh, before we decide to engage in any kind of so-called social engineering. Uh, and Hirschman says, uh, what this doesn't really point out uh, is that, yes, it is the case that whenever we engage in any kind of social planning, uh, the outcomes might be bad uh, and we might produce unintended outcomes that are bad, but we might also produce unintended outcomes that will be good, right? Uh, I might establish an education program in a low income community because I think it's important for kids to go to school. Uh, and one outcome of that that I might not have intended uh, is that since they have more opportunities available to them in life, uh, they are able to avoid uh, a lot of the bad parts of the economy. Uh, that you know they might otherwise be pushed into uh, if they didn't have those kinds of opportunities available to them. And you can run through examples of that for as long as you want, right? Uh, so I think that you know the germ of wisdom there that we shouldn't be engaging in wide-scale social planning without having a good idea of what it is that we're trying to accomplish uh, is sensible. Uh, but this idea that social planning never works uh, or will always produce bad unintended consequences, I don't think that there's any empirical case that you could make for that. Uh, and a lot of this is just based on this really frightened view uh, that we should be cautious uh, whenever we engage in planning because bad things might happen if we do uh, if we implement government plans. Uh, but there's no real sense that we might actually produce more good than we intended to, as indeed so many well-formulated and well-implemented plans have in, over the course of history yeah right i mean you know the um uh you know there's there's empirical evidence that you know raising the minimum wage which you know which is um you know intended to you know to just increase wage levels you know diminish uh the the sort of worst edges of economic inequality also um also like uh, leads to better health outcomes in many ways. People, you know, who are less financially stressed. Uh, well, higher trust. I mean, look at the Nordic countries uh, that every conservative seems to be afraid to actually look at with great in great depth, right? Uh, I mean, they're constantly talking about how we need more community spirit, more trust, that we're becoming divided when we should be united. Uh, well, most of the Nordic states, um, if you pull them, they are higher trust societies. Uh, and there is no doubt uh, that at least some of this has to do uh, with the fact that there's a more solidaristic system of social insurance that insulates people against the worst possibilities in life that there aren't here, right? Yeah, exactly. I'd, I'd also point out that there could be lots of unintended consequences of um, of things of allowing things that are already in place to stay in place, right? That if if you have, um, you know, if you uh, if you have early stage cancer, then um, you know, if you intervene in the situation, chemotherapy, et cetera, that can lead to all sorts of unintended consequences, right? Your hair falls out. 
but uh, but just letting you you know just letting the cancer do its thing without intervention you know uh, also leads to all sorts of bad consequences. It's not just that you know whatever the consequences you're currently living with are the only bad things that are ever going to happen as a result of letting things stay their course. I'd argue the same thing applies to um, societies as a whole, but. You know, it does seem to me that one of the things he's talking about when he talks about these equal chances fallacies, right? Of course, you're right. His ultimate point is, oh, if we try to, you know, equalize out, you know, outcomes more, then it'll lead to all these bad things. But he also thinks that people are making this fallacious inference where they say, oh, well, um, we don't have sort of equal representation for every group in every area therefore it must be uh the explanation must be discrimination now uh you know there must be like some sort of injustice going on to to produce this outcome now i actually agree with him that that's not in itself right a reasonable inference it would so so for example you know if uh, conservatives are underrepresented in academia, you know, be too hasty to say that that's because of discrimination. Uh, that uh, although you know, quite a few quite a few conservatives do seem to make precisely that inference when they look at that that uh, uh, when they look at those numbers. But uh, but no, I mean, in, in all seriousness, funny I mean, how that works, isn't it? Right? <laughs> yeah, right. Like it's yeah, political uh, disparities right? Statistically are always taken as evidence of discrimination, right? Even though like racial disparities aren't, it's like, well, why would that be? Right. But, um, but, you know, he does give plenty of fair examples, you know, when he's talking about like, you know, the overrepresentation of people of German descent and, you know, the beer industries and all these different countries where German people wouldn't necessarily have any sort of advantage. It's like, yeah, fair enough. Right, that there are sort of cultural and historical reasons that explain this without having to assume that anybody's being mistreated or discriminated against. All true, but my problem with it, or my first problem, is that if we're then going to apply it to disparities between white people and black people in the United States, I mean, it's not like we're just beaming in from an alien planet and noticing this disparity is we just have no information about how they came about. Right. We just have to guess. It's like, well, no, we, we do kind of know that like, you know, Jim Crow existed in the lifetime of people who are still alive, right. And, you know, many people who are still alive right now, you know, uh, we kind of know about FHA redlining and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, it, it seems like, you know, it seems like even though he's right, that it doesn't follow just from the existence of a disparity, that there must be an injustice causing the disparity. Uh, He's, you know, it it seems equally fallacious to say, well, just because there are sort of innocent disparities, that means that, you know, we should assume that any given disparity is innocent when we have like particular reasons given historical conditions to, uh, to think that those did play a role in producing those disparities. Uh, and I'd also point out that, I, yeah. I should please. also say that at yeah. the very least, um, some American libertarians seem cognizant of this fact. Um, Robert Nozick, right? Um, mm-hmm. An Anarchy State and Utopia, um, which is a book that I profoundly disagree with, I should say. Course, yeah. uh, but Nozick was a very smart guy. And again, uh, an original thinker who is willing to be more consistent on these points than somebody like Sowell is. Uh, because in a famous footnote to Anarchy State and Utopia, Nozick says, look, uh, the reality is the African-American community had their property rights uh, fundamentally violated for centuries, right? Uh, and going back further, uh, we could say that even worse happened to them, right? Uh, so consequently, as he famously put it, uh, while socialism may be too high a price for our sins, we should engage in enormous amounts of redistribution uh, to try to compensate the African-American community uh, for these violations of their property rights and their rights to individual autonomy that took place over many, 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 many centuries, right? Uh, and Sowell, or sorry, sorry, Sowell just has no patience uh, for these kinds of arguments, uh, which are predicated, I should say, on a libertarian commitment to justice, not a social justice commitment to justice, a libertarian commitment to justice grounded in the importance of rights to autonomy and property rights. Uh, because 
whenever people bring up these kinds of responses, he's just like, well, we've done enough for equality. Uh, how badly do you really want to actually see everybody be equal, right? Uh, and I don't think I can think of any serious leftist who's ever argued that people should be equal in every single respect, right? right? Uh, the claim following Nozick, right, uh, is usually just that very clear violations of people's rights, where there is a transparent set of consequences that emerge from the initial injustice, need to be taken seriously by society, right? Uh, and if Robert Nozick uh, was cognizant enough to actually make this argument, uh, then by all means, it should not be nearly as controversial as Sobel tries to make it out to be. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's I think that's totally right. Right. I mean, I, I think that the you know, I think that, again, even like even putting aside sort of normatively what you want to do about it, which is mm -hmm. where I think that the sort of deep differences between a libertarian perspective and a leftist one are going to come up. Right. But like, uh, but, you know, prior to that, just in terms of acknowledging the existence of the, of the problem, right. Like, uh, like, like I think just factually, it's like, yes, given everything that we know about slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it, it does seem like the sort of most parsimonious explanation of how these disparities came about is that, and not just some kind of deep, hard to quantify cultural, you know, difference that just happens to manifest in, you know, different poverty rates and, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, uh, so that's one thing, uh, another, um, uh, you know, another point that's related to that that does edge us into the normative domain is saying, you know, well, okay, uh, not all disparities are equally troubling, right? That if, if uh, you know, they, if there are, um, you know, if, if people who have been involved in like, you know, the beer industries of different countries around the world are disproportionately German, that doesn't really mean that like, you know, I mean, I mean, you don't, you don't really need to be in the beer industry to have a good life. You know, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of, you know, that that's relatively benign, right? Whereas, uh, whereas in a lot of the cases that we're talking about with racial disparities, you know, the reason that people are so troubled by them is we're talking about disparities that are not just like who happens to be overrepresented in this or that particular industry. But uh, much more basic things about, you know, poverty, education, incarceration, you know, uh, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Things that like really matter a lot, you know, yeah. uh, who who gets those things. Um, like just to give one example, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, so so all sometimes very glibly uh, will treat these arguments for equality. Um, that emerge from this demand for racial justice uh, by saying, you know, look, we move further towards equality uh, than anyone could have expected. You know, how badly uh, do you think we should just try to rectify every kind of inequity? Uh, and my response to that is, well, look, let's look at those numbers, right? Uh, the average African-American possesses $250,000 less wealth than the average white family, right? Uh, they earn about 30% less often when they're doing the same kinds of jobs, right? Those are very serious disparities, right? Uh, in terms of people's access to wealth uh, that are going to seriously impact their life outcomes and not just their life outcomes, but potential life outcomes for their family as well, right? Uh, so, Maybe we should take that a little bit seriously, uh, because I can guarantee you if you were to go to any conservatives uh, and tell them, you know, we are going to ax your salary by 30 percent, right. uh, <laughs> there would be fucking riots in the street. Right. Uh, and they'd be like, you know, get your hands off of my goddamn money. Right. Uh, but, you know, when it comes to these very glaring disparities that are the result of centuries of racialized oppression, uh, crickets. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and then, of course, I think, you know, the most interesting issue to me is the one where, you know, we and Nozick are going to come apart, right? Which is the, uh, okay, if we've acknowledged reality, right? We've, we've taken that first step of saying that the social and historical reality is what it is, that uh, that these disparities didn't just, you know, materialize out of thin air or it's 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 not just a the sum total of a bunch of cultural peculiarities like you know the fact that germans have been brewing beer for so much longer than you know than other ethnicities um but you know it is a result of of, of all kinds of serious historical injustices then the really interesting question is okay well now what do you want to do about it and 
it is interesting that despite the fact that Sol, you know, is an ex-Marxist, um, I don't really know how long he was or, you know, any of that, but like, you know, but, but that, you know, that, that is an important part of his origin story uh, that, and, um, and he has written about that before uh, that, you know, so much of what he says is not really directed against what like the hard left would say it's directed at a sort of certain kind of social justice liberalism, Mm -hmm. which, you know, I do think, I mean, you were talking earlier about the difference between soul, somebody like soul and somebody like Hayek. And I do think this is an important part of uh, the backdrop there that, you know, frankly, I think that part of the reason that we used to get better right-wing intellectuals is that they had a better left uh, to uh, that they were, they were countering. Right. So it's like people, you know, people in the era that gave us Hayek, you know, that's like you had a, a strong, confident socialist left that was like seriously thinking about how to, you know, to, to run like, you know, economic planning and a cooperative commonwealth. So you get, you know, these like smart right wingers like Hayek and von Mises who like actually made interesting objections to that. Uh, whereas now I think you have a much weaker and, and a much less ideologically focused left that's you know, that's, that's going to inspire a less interesting, uh, let, you know, less interesting, uh, conservatives, you know, in, uh, in response to it. Um, and, and in particular, I think that like, to the extent that like what they're focused on is not like, you know, again, you're not arguing with Oscar Lange about, you know, socialist planning, you know, you're, you're arguing with, you know, mediocre liberals about like what they think that social justice is. And I think a lot of this comes out here because, um, cause like, look, what I would ultimately say is that, you know, I don't want anybody to have to live under the conditions that, you know, black people are statistically more likely than white people to have to live under, but you know, plenty of white people do also oh, yeah. in, in the United States, right. You know, that, that this is, this is not a way that anybody should live. I don't think that justice means having, um, the demographically appropriate percentage of every group living in poverty and going to substandard schools and being, you know, funneled into prison and, you know, all of this stuff. Um, and the demographically appropriate number of members of every group sitting on the boards of, you know, Lockheed Martin and Goldman Sachs, you know, I, I, I think we should just fundamentally have a more equal society. And once you, you kind of do that, mental transition about what the goal is quite a bit of what soul says just becomes irrelevant, you know, that, and, 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 or even just obviously wrong, even just as a description of, of his enemies. Right. So um, in that clip that we watched earlier, where he's talking about cosmic justice, he says, well, regular justice is one size fits all, you know, the cosmic justice has to be hand tailored. It's like, well, look, if you mean a sort of more fundamental structural critique of existing injustice under capitalism, yeah, look, I I wouldn't deny that there are like particular uh, justice products that have to be hand tailored in some way. Right. I mean, that's the, you know, you do have to be cognizant of, you know, somebody who's like profoundly disabled and needs, you know, expensive medical equipment to get around. Doesn't just need the same things that everybody else does, for example, Mm -hmm. but as a general proposition, I would actually say the most plausible version of a left program, quite a bit of it is pretty fucking one size fits all, right? That it's that that's like, yeah, everybody should, you know, everybody should have an education. You know, everybody should should be able to go to school for free. Everybody should have health care. You know, everybody, you know, I would argue should have a roughly equal share of society's resources and an equal democratic say and you know what happens to those resources. And, you know, and, and I think once you, you know, once you kind of do that, I think you, you know, you make that fundamental transition and viewpoint. I think it's, I think like really the emptiness of a lot of souls critique really comes out because it's like, okay, well, what's the, you know, like, what are we arguing about? Right. Are we arguing about like whether sure it sounds better to say that there are certain rights that everybody should have that say, well, it's complicated. It depends. Right. Fair enough. But then if we're both saying there are certain rights everybody should have, now what we're arguing about is which ones those are, right? So uh, and so it's not that like, oh, you think the rules should be all over the place. I think there should be very simple rules. It's like, no, I, I think there are certain simple rules that, you know, 
I just think the simple rules that should apply to equally to everybody include, you know, everybody should get healthcare, everybody should get the same amount of autonomy in their working life, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's like, I don't really know what his response is to that, except no, you don't need any of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you want to talk about simple rules, I can explain to you the two principles that Rawls was committed to way more quickly uh, than I could summarize Thomas Sowell's basic worldview, right? Uh, and, you know, in some modes, he might actually see that as a virtue, right? Saying, well, that's just because my view is more complicated than Rawls. Uh, although in other moments, you'd sit there and be like, well, we should be aiming for uh, simplicity rather than letting these eggheads, uh, you know, sort things out. But I, I think fundamentally, the real knockdown argument against Sowell was actually very well articulated uh, by On Learning Economics, where I pointed out that Sowell is fundamentally committed to whatever he says, uh, a rapidly ideological worldview that is carefully insulated uh, against empirical evidence, right? Uh, because what he has to consistently insist on uh, is that the free market will just always produce a better outcome uh, than any kind of socialist or social democratic uh, intervention, right? Uh, and that is an enormous threshold to reach that I just don't think you can say has been borne out by history, right? Uh, certainly is the case that certain kinds of centralized planning have produced disasters, but it is also very clear if you look at world history uh, and the facts with any kind of dispassion uh, that things like public medicine work, right? Uh, public education works, right? Uh, social democracy, right? Uh, seems to work extremely well, right? Uh, and America's experiments uh, with it in the 1950s uh, produce a, certainly a more prosperous society than anything following Ptolemy's and Sowell's ideas have given to us uh, since then, right? Uh, so, by his own metric, right, uh, of being dispassionate, focused on facts, uh, one should reject Sowell's worldview for one that is much more open-minded, empirically driven, uh, and concerned with the way the world really operates. Uh, because I can just tell you for nothing, uh, if you spend a lot of time in Sowell land, uh, you might come away with a lot of good jabs directed against the left, but you will not come away with a very good understanding of how the world operates or ever will operate. Yeah, well, we can't come up with a better ending than that. So uh, let's leave it off there. Uh, I should note that there, uh, so uh, there is no post game tonight uh, because uh, I need to leave uh, like in the next few minutes uh, so I can drive up to uh, my parents' place uh, to drop off the cat and the dog so I can uh, get on a plane tomorrow uh, to go to Michigan where. Um, Gonna, you know, gonna be guest lecturing in Matt's class, uh, talking to his Hegel reading group, and also uh, for uh, the general public. Uh, while I'm there, I'm going to be giving a talk again. That's Thursday, March 21st, so three days from today, 6 p.m. at Old Main uh, 103 at Wayne State University, um, uh, co-sponsored by Metro Detroit DSA and Wayne State YDSA. The talks called "Debunking the Many Bad Arguments Made by Israel's Apologists in uh, in the West." So come out to that if you're around. Um, you know, come to the Q and A. Give me an argument, and um, then we can have a beer afterwards. Uh, and uh, you know, can you know continue anybody expressing views that are you know to uh, um, you know the. Uh, you know, anybody within the genocide is bad spectrum. I, I'm, I'll, 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 I'm willing to have a beer with afterwards, uh, you know, whatever else you think I get wrong. But um, so do come check that out. If, uh, if you were going to be around on Thursday and once again, Matt's article, which is very good is Thomas soul is a cynical man uh, at uh, Jacobin.com. Uh, we have gotten, you know, requests for a very long time to uh, to do an episode where we talk about Thomas Sowell. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> this, you know, we've uh, we've done it now. Uh, so thank you. And, and I just want to lay out. Uh, I do not want to do a sequel. Right? We did four parts to our Jordan Peterson takedown. If you sit there and tell me like you're gonna have to go back and read more Sowell because you know they're demanding yeah. more. Uh, yeah. Then you better be prepared to write me a very big fucking check. Yeah. Oh yeah. Can you write? Can you read a, another two thousand pages of Thomas Soul for next week? Uh, yeah. Gotta gotta go back to this now. Uh, next week we're gonna have uh, Nathan J. Robinson on the show. Uh, he uh, he just did a debate. Um, 
actually around the same time as the the more famous debate uh, came out with uh, Destiny about uh, Israel Palestine. So he's going to come on and chat about that, and we'll probably chat about that other debate too. So that's going to be next Sunday. So uh, Matt is off the hook. Uh, he, um, you know, also I, I I want him to be around to you know to to drink you know while I'm in Detroit. So uh, so so I'm, I'm releasing Matt from all reading more Thomas Sowell duties. Uh, he uh, doesn't have to do any of that this week. Uh, so uh, so yeah, I I will. Uh, I will see you uh, tomorrow night. Everybody yep. else, uh, yeah, no post game, no debate breakdown this this Thursday. Uh, but we'll be back here with Nathan Robinson next Monday. Left is best. Left is best. <laughs>